and how it does is it uh, acts at guanylate cyclase and uh, prevents vascular relaxation in effect causing constrictions of the dilated vessels so there you are this looks like a good thing more physiological but how, how often it works is a million dollar question now another rescue thing ECMO do we have a place for that I don't know uh, again if nothing else works what else you have to think of ECMO and this uh, Lakshmi Kumar uh, reported a patient in um, about a couple of years back where they use ECMO post transplant in a patient who had HPS and they were able to successfully get him off the ventilator but it has its own risk cannulas large size cannula lying close to the graft anastomosis you have to use anticoagulation in, in these patients who have so, such a big uh, raw surface infection is a risk <coughs> and uh, <coughs> look at uh, oxygen requirement all the studies even Gupta study if you see they require long period of oxygen requirement months up to three months patients have uh, required oxygen so you must be careful and prepare your patients that this is what they might have to deal with and they must accept that and you must have an algorithm using all these different measures uh, uh, simplest measures first Trendlenburg increasing your FiO2 then maybe somewhere comes nitric oxide severe patient I will tell you in like in our study uh, patient with several HPS <coughs> do have higher morbidity uh, if you compare with less than 50 versus more than 50 uh, mmHg uh, PO2 uh, duration of oxygen requirement was longer duration of ventilation is longer and in fact we have we lost one patient and two patients also had intracerebral hemorrhage so you can do them but uh, the severe the disease uh, poor is the outcome to summarize it's a progressive disease HPS is progressive diagnose it early and try and do transplant earlier than leaving it for very late prolonged oxygen therapy is required be prepared for that but most patients do come off oxygen severity of HPS is not a contraindication Thank you. So any words from the panel? Hi, Dr. Vora. How are you? Hi, good, good, good. How are you guys? Good, sir. All good. So apologies for inconvenience caused to you because of the uh, timing related to the GBM, so so that don't we go, could... don't worry, don't 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 don't, don't stop. Yeah, it was a very it's fantastic right. talk, and it is always uh, nice to hear you because uh, your talk is always uh, based practical and evidence based. So one question I want to ask, though, it is uh, so: is there any uh, absolute contraindication, or is there any cutoff of the PO2 based upon which you decide that with uh, whether a patient requires a liver transplant or not, whether we can do the transplant or not? Because though the liver transplant is uh, the treatment of modality for the patients who have uh, HPS. You see, uh, you, sh you can make your own cutoff with your own experiences. Yes. Uh, you know, less than 50, everybody says high morbidity, high, uh, you know, poor outcome, long oxygen therapy, that's great. But I think, you know, in the one slide which I showed also, I feel one should, all these patients uh, must have, you must do a response to 100% oxygen. Yes. So that gives you an idea. You see, 
you know, these shunts, they are not like simple shunts. You know, it's not going to be uniform shunt. Exactly. You know, it might respond to different things. It might respond to posture. It might respond to, God knows, nitric oxide or whatever, you know, when, when the time comes. So I really feel if by giving 100% oxygen, you can get a decent amount of PO2. Uh, although the literature says more than 300, but I think even 200, if you can achieve by 100% oxygen, you have a good chance of getting that patient safely through. And, uh, you know, long oxygen therapy, yes. Yeah, you can't really say how long each uh, HPS is going to take to really come off uh, oxygen therapy. So I think my, my take would be even if it is PO2 of 40, and if I'm able to get give 100% oxygen and get a PO2 of 200, I think he, that, that patient does deserve a chance. Exactly, because when uh, we have encountered a patient who had a PO2 of uh, 45, so a lot of discussion happened in the team. And then finally, as you said, we decided to go for the transplant, though he survived, but he was on the oxygen therapy for a very long period, around yeah. uh, three to four months. But yes, because that thought came to my mind that uh, is there any absolute uh, PO2 value where we should say that yes, that this patient is going to tolerate or whether it's going to modify his lifestyle after the transplant. So that's what. And, and, and you also have to make sure that there's nothing else in the way. You know, he doesn't have it. Exactly, because the transplant is the only modality of treatment for yeah, the, the yeah. severe SPS patients. Exactly, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. No, what I was saying is, if not just SPS, maybe you're not missing out on interstitial lung disease sure. to an extent yeah. or something somehow he has definitely you have to rule out all other possible causes of yeah, leading yeah, the yeah. hypoxia and all. Yeah. yes Vishant, yeah. any other question from your side sir i just wanted to ask you that we are st we are started to uh, like having patients who has had covid recently and they are now <laughs> having fibrosis yes. so uh, do you think there should be some modification in the criteria which we have been using because uh, i think uh, Yes, yes. Very, 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 very difficult take. I, I think you just have to play it by the ear, really. If it is a known HPS, you know, you'll be a bit confused, you know, how much is the HPS and how much is uh, the COVID. But I, I think... 100% test will still stand, I suppose. Uh, giving 100% and seeing the PO2 rising again. So I think I think that still... will still help. That will still help. You know, yes. if, if the lungs are decent enough, to build up a PO2 of 100, or sorry, 200, I think we will, that, that should still uh, hold good. Yes. So plus, sir, uh, there are many patients which are not able to do pulmonary function tests. So, yeah. so where you would you, which test you would give a more uh, like weightage? You see, I tell you, what are we looking in PFTs for? You know, you must be very clear in your mind what, what do you want. You want to. Yeah. Some of them might have a situs, will have a little bit of restrictive disease out. You know, you have already probably made a diagnosis even without the pulmonary function test. And other thing is restrictive lung disease. So, oh, sorry, obstructive lung disease. If the patient is not wheezy enough, I think you are probably okay. Now, the last thing is diffusion abnormality. I think in your uh, HPS patient, if you have a highly decreased diffusion you know you if you do dlco in your hvs patient most of them have at least 30 percent diffusion reduction in their dlco so i think 30 40 percent is okay if it goes beyond that i think i'll, I'll be worried over there but having said that still 100 percent oxygen is uh, i think for me would be uh, you know the benchmark right sir. Dr. Prem wanted to say something. Yes, Nishant had brought up, a, first of all, a very nice presentation as usual, sir. It is a, really we love hearing to you. And uh, Nishant had raised a very valid point in this COVID era, right? We are having patients, recipients recovered from COVID disease and having CORADS 3 or 4 on CT, even after a month with uh, all the tests negative, RT-PCR and everything negative. Yeah. And the PO2 is also low, right? And it is bubble liquid suggesting HPS, but mask <laughs> at 5%, right? 
we do the 100% reversibility test the pao2 has risen from 52 to 460 but post operatively we find that to oxygenate the patient is a real difficulty because his oxygen even with say niv also the po2 is around about somewhere 60 to 70 why this problem occurs when we have done the reversibility test and found that the reversibility or the response is so good that from 52 it has risen to 460 but post operatively it does not rise i hope i, I really encountered this problem Actually, corona has led to has to has led to the revision of all the protocols what have been made for the hps or other diseases i, I don't think any you will get a simple answer to that you still have to believe in what you see and do it i i even if in your patient it did you know you were not able to get him off i mean this bad luck but i i really no 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 we got him out but it took a long yeah. time on oxygen yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so they the surgeon is it's very difficult to explain to the surgeon that he says that you did the test and it you said that it is 460 and we yeah. went ahead so we have waited for the covid uh, symptoms or anything what are the ct findings to further regress or i think i think ct finding take a very long time you know mm-hmm. i have seen ct of patients uh, at least 3 months after they still have a, a lot of areas on the ct is are still there to you know you they know, might be having a bit of fibrosis even if they have a bit of fibrosis if that lung is you know not in use uh, you know you have still other part of the lung which is probably taken over i th- i think you know probably that patient whatever patient you are talking about if they had something more to it maybe something else got on to maybe he was more prone to infections maybe he picked up some bug maybe something go i don't know but i mean you know that, la- last week had uh, uh, we had this uh, patient uh, with for laparoscopic cholecystectomy who had had covid in november so uh, post extubation he has had that Uh, uh i mean he had lot of spasm and uh, looking to his chest x ray it was a very pretty bad uh, x ray and he was having a saturation of around 96 or 96 uh, 96 95 so i was just wondering whether we should delay a uh, elective procedure for more period because we waited for around 3 months was uh, x ray normal do, before you began will it help was the x ray normal when you took him up for lap coli or was it uh, bad even then you said it, the x ray was very it bad. was bad it was bad even there were you... there were fibrotic changes i what uh, kind of classified uh, lap coli was it kind of emergent or something because so, i think if i saw lung findings and mild symptoms i would wait for a lap coli it might be that the chest uh, was pretty crippled before this like, so, so how long should we how long should we uh, like postpone it for i think till resolution of symptoms or unless you know that the changes on ct are fibrotic and do not have a potential to recover mm-hmm. or you should have an asymptomatic patient with these lung changes i think we have done a large number of patients and uh, when you see this kind of uh, de- not transplant i think uh, uh, prem has a uh, prem is the one who's done a post covid transplant i'm not sure if they've done one um but we haven't had too many problems but if i saw a very bad x ray pre op perhaps i wouldn't take for a lap coli so uh, so, so no, no. what what do you think should be done uh, like we should investigate further like which which test would you would you like to take well i think the ct and uh, you say you when you see a bad x ray perhaps at least in these patients a few slices of ct chest may help to right right to a direction as to what you're dealing with which is what we do when we see that we ask the radiologist to take not multiple slices but just a few distinct and we take a call based upon symptoms time from recovery uh, floor i mean if it's potential to recover and then of course emergent nature of surgery versus semi elective right so lakshmi this patient which is talking about this is about if i am right 3 months post covid yes, yes exactly. nishan yes sir so, and, i mean november he, november and mean more than 3 yeah, months so. more than 3 months so he was asymptomatic from clinically he had recovered 
and uh, you know these i mean again some of these changes may not just go away so easily so these change, so it was not an active active uh, what do you call uh, covid so so now asymptomatic situation symptoms is just being coincidental because you sometimes have post extubation problems even in otherwise asymptomatic patients so could be so man. could be okay. uh, we could put that as one of the dds like and we do have some lab coolies who get strider or airway issues okay, so, okay. right thank you yes dr peyush uh, dr vora uh, yeah. dr vora here i want Andrew. to ask you there, there are many centers who don't have a uh facilities for nitric oxide and don't have a uh, ecmo should yeah. they go ahead with the liver transplant in these patients or not dekho i am very clear about it if you don't have provisions don't do it you know you don't know where you are going to get stuck yeah. so uh, you know when we had a severe patient we were not able to get nitric oxide from the cardiac side we mm -hmm. waited i i don't think you can play around with it you if it is a severe let's say hps mm -hmm. i think you should even be prepared mentally prepared at least think about even doing ecmo if the need be so aapke paas if you don't have ecmo if you don't have nitric oxide i think uh, you know i don't think it's it's it's, it's fair to take on uh, these patients yeah. and my next question is if you have any idea how many centers have these facilities available to them i don't know we have uh, i am sure you have yeah. i know i know lakshmi has i know piyush has so yeah. nitric of nitric oxide is yeah. no big deal nitric oxide is no yeah. big deal uh, all the cardiac centers have nitric oxide used they use it for pulmonary hypertension yeah. patients so really uh, nitric oxide is not a problem you can even get it on uh, let's say case to case basis if you if you want uh, you know i i i remember having a word with the company when we were yeah. thinking of doing a patient in mumbai mm -hmm. and they said no problem they will deliver the uh, nitric oxide cylinder there so that's not an issue that's not okay thank you uh, excuse me uh, we'd like to continue this discussion over to the next session thank you everybody Uh, for our next session, we have an elite panel of chairperson. We have Dr. Achal Dhir. He is a director, liver transplant anesthesia, associate professor, Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine, London Health Science Centre, Western University, Ontario, Canada. We have Dr. C K Pandey, director, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Medanta Hospital, Lucknow. We have Dr. Vijay Vora with us again, uh, chairman, liver anesthesia and critical care, Medanta Hospital, Gurgaon. And we have Dr. M K Arora. with us senior professor and head anesthesia lbs vasant kunj new delhi for a first uh, topic we'll be having dr shweta singh with us she is director and head anesthesia and critical care clbs max center of uh, liver and biliary sciences max super speciality hospital saket new delhi ma'am the floor is to you thank you it's good to see everyone uh, good afternoon everyone uh, should i thank you piyush for giving me the opportunity to speak on such a i don't have words to describe it how challenges have evolved over decades and uh, sure enough liver transplant has come a long way there has has been so much change in operating techniques in knowledge in experience but this is how we started this was how in the last decade we were having patients they did go up to these kind of patients but now we have patients like these we have sick aclf patients who are on multiple organ supports and we have patients with chronic liver disease not aclf but they have so many comorbidities this was just one of our patients recently he was a 67 year old ethanol related cld who was sarcopenic with two stents and hemiplegic and he had also recovered from corona recently so with this kind of a patient and a family which is very very keen for transplant and saying kaise bhi kar dijiye and we have these kind of donors this is the kind of donors we began with asa1 healthy donors and now our donors are different we have those who are younger but may be smoking may be social drinkers may be recreational drug abuse and on with various comorbidities managed 
uh, optimized yes but seriously a challenge and so we have evolved we're taking sicker patients we have more complex procedures there are complex anatomies there are marginal grafts and we have marginal donors so i will talk about i will restrict my talk to anesthetic and anesthesia uh, challenges and what how we have evolved there because i think it's very vast number of centers have picked up each center is doing more patients sicker patients disease donor transplant has also picked up in the last decade there is a little more awareness in the country numbers have definitely grown we haven't reached where we wanted to but disease donor is happening but i'll restrict my talk to living donor and what we really do here so if we start with what is responsible for mortality after liver transplant then it is usually the cardiovascular complication so i'll begin from that so we when we are evaluating cardiac dysfunction we've always known that the incidence of prevalence of cad in liver disease patients is quite high and the incidence of complications is high and so we need to evaluate these patients non invasive stress testing dobutamine stress echo is being used and pre transplant cardiac revascularization has been recommended so what has we learned over the last decade what we have realized is that dsc may not be reliable and 85% of predicted heart rate may not be achieved so there will be inconclusive tests and there will be tests where there may be complications and there will be termination of pregnancy uh, sorry termination of the test so it is difficult we need something more and coronary angiography is the gold standard but there is discordance patients who have non obstructive cad may also have events cardiac events after transplant intraoperatively so coronary angiography only gives us limited information so what more do we have we have coronary angio and we have uh, coronary uh, calcium scores so uh, if we look at the uh, the non invasive angiography it can be recommended in patients who are having more than two risk factors and when this is combined with a calcium score then uh, then it can be useful for predicting which patient should undergo coronary angiography because coronary angiography per se should cannot be done in each and every patient and we have also started using the functional tests much more so as we assess mets for every surgery equivalent four mets if a patient can achieve and especially if it is a metabolic liver disease it is considered good and we have other tests which have been used in the last decade like cpex and it has shown that uh, an anaerobic threshold value which was taken as 11 in certain studies in liver transplant it has been shown that a value of about 9 was associated with better prediction of which patients are going to have more problem which patients will have 90 day survival which patients will have increased length of hospital stay it it is also been known that yes we can definitely stent these patients and the preferred strategy which has been supported is a bare metallic stent followed by 30 days of antiplatelet and aspirin there have been trials there have been studies which have shown that one year survival is high and it is comparable and this can be done there are case reports which have talked about off pump coronary artery and uh, bypass grafting and synchronous cabg with liver transplantation can also be done but not, not much has been achieved in the form of guidelines coming to cirrhotic cardiomyopathy which is also one of our favorites there has been definition and clear clarity in the eco parameters earlier we were just looking at uh, the isovolumetric relaxation for diastolic dysfunction we were looking at at the ejection fraction now those who have a maintained ejection fraction it is recommended that we should see the global longitudinal strain which may be affected first in diastolic dysfunction we can see the ee dash ratio we have to see velocities across the mitral valve the left atrial volume index tricuspid regurgitation so there has been some clarity on and maybe some detailing on what needs to be seen for uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy to be diagnosed better coming to pulmonary issues which are also a common problem for all of us so i would want to talk about the ilts practice guidelines in diagnosis there is nothing new in hepatopulmonary syndrome we all know that we need to evaluate our patients for uh, hypoxemia but the only thing which has happened in the last decade is that we uh, since meld is associated with uh, since hps is associated with a poorer prognosis hence uh, hypoxia which is po2 less than 60 was was said to have been given exception points meld exception points and so these patients definitely need so the hps is a 
uh, HPS is an indicator for transplant. It's a uh, liver transplant is the management. But when they did a study to see after in the uh, in the Western world that if these patients were prioritized, it was seen that no association was seen between weightless mortality and severe hypoxemia. And in fact, those patients who were transplanted early because their PO2s were less, they had severe hypoxia between 45 to 50, they had increased risk of free, uh, transplant uh, hospital morbidity and mortality post-transplant, and they had severe hypoxemia post-transplant. So the recommendation which is now being studied is, should these patients not be expedited for transplant if they're they are suffering from very severe hypoxemia, which is about 45 to 50 pre-transplant. So this is the new change. And the rest is what, at least we don't use it, that if, you're, uh, if, if your patient is having a mixed venous oxygen saturation, which is low, then you need to think of venovenous bypass. It might help. So this is a recommendation, which I think is something which we can all uh, think over. The rest of the recommendations for hepatopulmonary syndrome management are same. The patients can be extubated early. They should be maintained on oxygen. You need to keep them negative the goal, with goal-directed fluid therapy so that their oxygenations are maintained and maintain them with monitoring of oxygen without doing any CTs or thoracic echoes. But the presence of an extracorporeal membrane oxygenator definitely has given us the confidence as we were discussing just before the uh, start of the session that yes, the presence and the availability of an extracorporeal mem membrane oxygenator helps us in giving by giving us the confidence that we can take up the patient on this. And this is uh, an advancement which has happened over the decade that we have learned how to use this machine more. Earlier, there was small case reports which were coming, which were showing that yes, they have tried it and it is working. Now there is a lot of evidence, uh, there are case uh, now, instead of individual case reports, we have series of utility of ECMO where patient, in high volume transplant centers where they're using ECMO routinely. Coming to portopulmonary hypertension, ILTS has not told us anything new. Again, we know how to diagnose it. We know when to do the right heart cath. How do we have to optimize these patients prior to transplant? Again, the presence of inhaled nitric oxide has definitely helped. It has been there always, but we have gained the confidence with the presence of ECMO, with the presence of a pulmonary artery catheter, and with the presence of a TEE. So TEE has been recommended for right ventricular assessment and for right ventricular function assessment during HPS by the ILTS practice guidelines. And they have, uh, they have also given MELD exception points to patients with POPH, especially if the mean pulmonary artery pressure is more than 35, and if there is good RV function, or if you are managing this patient with medical therapy and there is improvement in uh, pulmonary artery pressures, then the Western world advises giving meld exception points, which in our setup means uh, we should take up these patients. But again, it needs to be seen that these criteria are uh, applica applied correctly. Another thing which has happened over the last decade is recognition of the concept of nutrition in chronic liver disease. Patients with CLD have always, we have always known that they are malnourished. But when we were using the previous indicators like midarm circumference, triceps, skin incidence was prevalent, really high. About, about 50% patients were malnourished when we used midarm muscle circumference. And these objectives, they were not objective, these traditional markers, and they were affected by the fluid overload. And they did not have a good survival impact if they were addressed. So there came the concept of sarcopenia and it was seen that sarcopenia was associated with poor survival post-transplant and on the waiting list. And it is also an independent predictor of sepsis. And in this particular study, when they addressed nutrition over a decade, over 2008 and 11, when 100% patients were, their nutrition was assessed, the incidence of sepsis went down. Another concept which has come up is frailty. Frailty, which is an increased vulnerability to health stresses and reduced physiological reserve, again, has been associated with waitlist mortality. It is attracting a lot of interest in the last decade, which is because it has seen that it is a potentially modifiable factor with, you can improve the muscle mass with nutritional therapy and exercise. So there has been a need to, a need to develop the cutoffs for each population based on race and gender has come in a big decade. 
coming to renal dysfunction where do we stand so we've known all along that hepatorenal syndrome i mean before a decade ago also we knew that liver transplant is the treatment of choice for hrs but we were diagnosing it differently we were classifying the severity differently and we were treating it differently and all patients were started on noradrenaline with albumin or terlipresin with albumin now the latest recommendations tell you that yes it is a treatment but they have changed the classification now no longer is serum creatinine more than 1.5 required for diagnosing hrs uh, there is a rise in serum creatinine of more than 0.3 there is a drop in urine output there is a rise in 40 50% from the baseline value and there is a new uh, definition of hrs 1 and 2 which was earlier has been changed to hrs aki and non aki so there is a greater understanding this was the previous definition from 2007 where there was which i have already mentioned where the emphasis was on withdrawal of diuretics now the emphasis is on more on volume expansion with albumin which saves time these things help identify the patient faster there is no recommendation that you got to keep on treating them till they really improve and then you can take them up now the recommendation is that you give the treatment if there is a response fine if there is no response these patients need to be taken up for transplant because liver transplant is the treatment of choice for hrs and the feasibility and availability of renal replacement therapy especially intraoperatively has also given us the confidence that we can do it as suggested in this paper by caravelas we also did a similar study in which we Uh, took up similar patients who did not respond, and uh, so many of our patients who did not respond, we managed with renal replacement therapy before and after. So that now this was only possible because we knew that if we have the need for intraoperative CRRT, we can do it. So this is a change in concept with for renal dysfunction. Another thing which comes to our, which is a challenge for us, is when we have a patient who has chronic, we know that this patient needs both liver and kidney transplant. so a combined liver kidney transplant may or may not be scheduled for many patients in our setups because we are doing living donor and although immunologically the kidney will do better if we have a combined liver kidney but it has been shown that even a simultaneous liver kidney seems to be a good alternative because this is uh, combined liver and this is uh, simultaneous liver so the patient survival and the graft survival has been shown to be good even with sequential liver kidney transplant rather than just opting for combined liver kidney and this is good to know for us also coming to newer monitoring techniques so in transfusion management this is where we started and here we have improved a little bit because we have with time learned how to predict so all along and in the last decade and the decade before that people were trying to reduce their transfusions because it is important to reduce transfusions and i won't go into that and we have seen that coagulation defects per se do not predict transfusion requirement because there is a rebalanced theory of hemostasis in chronic liver disease but again when we come to prediction it has always been about preoperative and intraoperative factors because post operative graft function will depend on donor selection and how the surgery goes earlier we were focusing on disease etiology disease severity ctp and med score preoperative hemoglobin inr platelet count serum creatinine previous abdominal surgery and there are so many papers talking about it but now we are not talking so much about these but we are talking about low starting hv we are talking about coagulopathy preoperatively not inr and platelet count we are talking about adhesions which could be because of sbp tuberculosis or surgery so our strategies and our understandings have changed the other things that we are addressing now is uh, these and in the non surgical factors low cvp with phlebotomy use of factor concentrates so that we can con we can reduce the cvp anti fibrinolytics use of viscoelastic monitoring these things have helped us develop our strategy and use of uh, for better management coming to cardiac monitoring pulmonary artery catheter which had come into vogue in 1970 but many case reports started coming up which told us that there were problems so now we are re relying on use of pulmonary artery catheter only in select indications like uh, like i talked about uh, porto pulmonary hypertension where we really need to see the main pulmonary artery pressure so this has evolved our other methods of monitoring cardiac output minimally invasive and the non invasive ones and they have their advantages and disadvantages but a number of them we are relying on because even if they have not been validated in 
extremes of blood pressure. They, uh, when we observe them as a trend, they do give us reliable information. So although it has been, and this is a new monitor, which I want to talk about. This is a non-invasive cardiac output monitor, which has been helpful in, uh, in our case management of pediatric cases also, because this, this is another development of the last decade. Coming to transesophageal echo. So transesophageal echo, there was always a worry whether we can put it, whether we can use it, because patients have varices. So the Society of Advancement of SATA, the Society of Advancement of Transplant Anesthesia convened a task force, and they have concluded that TE is effective, TE is safe, and TV can, TE can provide timely diagnosis of unanticipated life-threatening conditions in transplant recipients with complication rates similar to those in cardiac surgery. So you can put in a TE probe, you do not need a certification. And these are the five view protocol which has been proposed, which provides 92% diagnosis in which two views have been removed so that you can rely on these five views and two T. Excuse there me, has been a... there's a time constraint, can we? Yeah, I can stop, stop any time. Fast. Okay, so I can continue then. So there has been a raging debate on crystalloids versus colloids. The last decade has seen the onset of use of albumin for various medical indications for hepatorenal syndrome, for surgery, hyperoncotic albumin, but the, the, the debate has continued. And now albumin is here to stay. And in fact, there was a recommendation that patients should be kept on weekly albumin so that their outcomes are better prior to surgery. Now that has gone. Then came the raging controversy of hydroxyethyl starch. There was a box office warning that it should not be used. And even after that, there are uh, uh, it has been advocated that no, it can be used, so each to its own, but if you're using low molecular weight with high degree, with lower degree of substitution, then probably they can be used in smaller quantities. Chloride liberal fluids are associated with injury, so we use balanced salt solutions like plasmalite, sterofundin, and gabilite. There has been a lot of progress in the area of management of acute liver failure. We know that the outcomes have really improved with medical management. The major killer had been cerebral edema. And there, in the last decade, we have moved on from invasive ICP monitoring to non-invasive using ONST and TCD. CRRT and ALF has really helped because CRRT helps not only impact cerebral edema, but also the renal dysfunction, which is associated with ALF. In ASL, in its consensus statement on acute liver failure, has suggested early institution of CRRT for management of all modalities. And for raised ICP as well, and prevention of raised ICP. Although it has its problems, but we have learned to overcome them, how to give anticoagulation with the available of regional citrate anticoagulation. Plasma pheresis also deserves a mention because it has been seen that high volume plasma exchange does improve transplant free survival in patients of acute liver failure in this open randomized controlled trial. And plasma exchange in patients with ACLF has also improved survival in patients who did not undergo transplant at 30 days and 90 days. Coming to fast track and fast tracking is, has in liver transplant actually been talked about and it means early extubation, whether you do it in the ICU or you do it on the table. And now again, there has been a lot of work which has been done. There are very many advantages of doing fast tracking, but from the previous predictors of fast tracking over the decade, from this to SORELT criteria. Now things are simpler. We look at how sick was the patient? Did he have encephalopathy? The concept of muscle mass has come in, neither too low nor too much. Should not be morbidly obese or sarcopenic. How much blood was used during the surgery? Is the liver working well? Was there a smooth reperfusion? How is, how is the liver behaving clinically and otherwise? And then you take a call for extubation. So this is our team. And I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to interact with you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for taking us through this journey uh, of a decade-old journey of uh, liver transplant anesthesia. Uh, we'll take the questions later after the entire session is over. For our next uh, topic, we have Dr. Akila Rajkumar. She's a senior consultant, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Rela Institute, Chennai. Dr. Akila, please. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, respected chair. Thanks, Piyush, for having me here. Are my slides visible? Yeah, we can see. Yeah. So I was asked to talk on nutritional status and liver transplantation and the implications for nutritional status uh, for transplant candidacy. 
Now, why is this important? Both extremes are nutritional status, um, pose significant challenges in the perioperative period, both undernourished ones and the overnourished ones. Several studies have evaluated post-transplant outcomes with malnutrition, and they've said um, poor outcomes are, are seen with malnutrition, should definitely be a part of the assessment to determine candidacy for transplantation. And there are several strategies have been evolved to identify patients with poor nutrition status to optimize this cohort. Um, what happens with obese recipient? I'll be talking in detail about a malnourished recipient. So briefly about an obese recipient, you can have problems which are graph related. To get an ideal volume is going to be very difficult. And especially with live donors, it's going to be very, very difficult. Coexistent cardiopulmonary issues can be there in obesity because of the metabolic syndrome. They will have delayed recovery and all anesthetic complications which happen with obese patient are due to happen in these patients as well. And you can expect a recurrence of disease in the graft if lifestyle modifications and prehabilitations are not induced before transplant. So this is a table which shows a number of uh, studies which you have, which shows the clinical impact of malnutrition in patients with ESLD who present as candidates for liver transplant. So the prevalence has been quoted to be anywhere between 25 to 70%. There is a wide range because the way we measure it is different. And the clinical significance, most of them are associated with worse survival, prolonged hospital and ICU stay, increased incidence of infections, more mortality after transplant, and more mortality while, wait, while on the wait list. Now, this is a nice table by Tandon et al. The, they show why malnutrition is more common in patients waiting for liver transplantation. And also, they propose potential treatment for malnutrition and liver transplant candidate. One thing is a diminished nutrient intake, which they have. It's because of the ascites. They have early satiety. And we do know that uh, the gastric emptying is delayed in them. They also have impaired uh, digestion because of the altered portosystemic circulation. Absorption of nutrients is affected. They have a loss of appetite. The gustatory threshold is shown to be altered in these patients. They have this juicier because of micronutrient deficiencies and the inflammatory cytokines play a role in most of the manifestations of these patients. And another important thing is the frequent hospitalizations these patients uh, require. So the lack of regular meals for, for examinations and procedures also causes problems with them. So they've, they've said if ascites is a problem, consider tips as a treatment and have smaller meals, four to six smaller meals every day. They're more frequent in smaller meals and the need for supplement of uh, trace elements to avoid dysgeusia and avoid unnecessary dietary restrictions, plan their schedule in such a way that they're not waiting in the OPD for a longer time or uh, advise them to pack nutrition supplements while they're waiting, resume regular meal patterns as soon as possible and caloric requirements have to be met. I will, I will talk about a little more in detail as I go down. And they have a hypermetabolic state because the hyperdynamic circulation, the energy expenditure is very high. The requirement is also very high. And the gut barrier function is compromised and they're more prone to have bacterial translocation. This again happens because of the portal hypertensive entropathy. They're more prone to develop infections. So one strategy suggested is antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with previous episodes of SBP, which helps, um, uh, one second, which helps them. The other factors uh, which can cause malnutrition are the inadequate synthesis, which are more important, or absorption of the micronutrients. Body protein is lost. It's again because of inadequate synthesis or the diminished storage capacity. I've, uh, problems with the enterohepatic circulation and the multiple paracentesis, overzealous administration of the diuretics and the large volumes of paracentesis, which happens in these patients also contributes to loss of body protein. So um, this again, the treatment strategies proposed are um, adequate uh, protein replacement, albumin replacement and tips if the ascites is refractory requiring uh, regular paracentesis, testosterone replacement in male patients has also been suggested. Another important factor to note is the decreased hepatic glycogen reserves which happen in these patients with end-stage liver disease. So what happens is in any times of demand, they early switch to gluconeogenesis happen. So the muscle protein is broken down, leading to loss of skeletal muscle mass. So this causes sarcopenia, and I will talk about it again in a little more detail. So as we said, uh, malnutrition causes a loss of skeletal muscle mass, sarcopenia, and this becomes initiates a vicious cycle where you see that um, because of all these factors and the addition of comorbid factors in these patients, 
will cause them to become progressively immobile, which causes more of skeletal muscle breakdown and weakness, and thus ensues a concept of physical frailty. So frailty in liver transplantation, initially defined for the geriatric population, widely used in the liver transplant population, it is a biological syndrome where the patients have decreased physiological and functional reserve and pose increased vulnerability to stressors. Any complications in the pre-transplant waiting period or post-transplant period, they're not able to cope because of the decreased physiological reserve. So frailty has recently evolved as a term to denote multiple components of patients with liver disease. Like <laughs> Sarcopenia and everything is integrated together. And this has become a well-accepted predictor of mortality and other outcomes following liver transplantation. Uh, Jennifer Lai is, is a person who's done extensive research and work on um, the frailty index. They've also proposed a liver frailty index. So they, um, she proposed a model, a framework, where they divide patients into three categories. Candidate A is a patient who has very less pre-transplant vulnerability, so they'll cope with all the stresses post-transplant, so you, have, you can proceed with transplant. There is a second candidate, candidate B, who's moderate vulnerability before transplant, still has some capacity to cope with this um, post-transplant uh, stresses, and they could be transplanted. Candidate C is a patient who has extreme vulnerability even in the pre-transplant period. So these are patients who are severely frail. They will not be able to cope with the, with the stressors which happen post-transplant. So they should be uh, and transplant should be denied for these patients. So we should bear in mind that not all factors are modifiable. There will be coexistent cardiopulmonary conditions, older age and multiple comorbidities where, where uh, patients cannot be mod cannot be optimized. So it's not possible to move a patient from the category C to category B and uh, render them transplantable. It's a category B which we are worried about and we can optimize them. We'll have to focus on these patients, optimize them and improve them so that they can face a transplant with, you know, and, and, and they are able to cope with the stress better. So the frailty index, again, uh, proposed by uh, Jennifer Lai and the team. So they have shown that it seems to predict mortality better in patients with end-stage liver disease, especially when combined with MEL scores. This is a patient with MEL14 and robust liver frailty index. They have a better uh, survival probability compared to a patient with a MEL sodium of 23, and they're very frail. So they have given different combinations of mel sodium and uh, different frailty index. So when combined, mel sodium and uh, the liver frailty index seem to predict mortality better in patients with end-stage liver disease. There's another study where um, subjective clinical assessment, clinician assessment, is coupled with the liver frailty index measurements, which again has shown to improve patients, uh, the, the prediction of mortality in patients with cirrhosis. This is done UCSF, 529 patients were included in this study. Um, the, another important interesting finding is not the baseline frailty index, but the changes in frailty as they are in the wait list also is an important predictor of outcome in patients with cirrhosis. So they've looked into the delta LFI, the delta LFI trajectory at, at, the, at the period when they are recruited into the study and they're followed up for 12, 24 months. This is the largest group of patients. I think more than 1,000 patients have been included in this study. Um, and I think uh, they have, sorry, Okay, so more than 1000 patients from eight transplant centers in the US have been recruited for this study. And you can see that patients with a low um, LFI, irrespective of the baseline LFI, the ones who've been stable, the mortality rate have remained at 7, 10 and 17 over 6, 12 and 24 months period. But those who've improved the LFI has improved, the mortality rate is significantly reduced to a fraction when, while those who progress from stable to severe disease have very, very increased chances of dying while on the transplant wait list. So this is an important finding. So, and it also gives us an option, one venue to optimize patients and improve outcomes while they're on the transplant wait list. So again, this is another study which says Frailty before transplant alone is not important because 
uh, you can optimize them, but whatever be the baseline frailty, these patients take a longer time. It does worsen in the first three to six months after transplant and takes a very long time. By around 12 months only, they regain their functional capacity and only about half of the patients regain their functional capacity after a transplant. So it is a very, very important factor in predicting um, outcomes and the way the patients go after transplant. Therefore, it is important to use a toolkit to assess and quantify frailty, to assess candidacy and estimate prognosis in these patients. And also, it's not a baseline value is important. You'll have to redo it at regular visits. The center can decide how frequently it wants to do it. So there are several uh, toolkits available to assess the frailty. The KPS, Kanowski Performance Test, has been widely used because it's easy. Uh, but the problems with it are, it is, it is a subjective one. It is patient reported performance index. This has been used in the UNOS um, database because it's easy to use. Um, ADL is one, six minute walk test and liver frailty index are more objective tests. So um, they are well validated and LFI is, is more validated compared to the six minute walk test as a indicator of underlying frailty of the patient, the liver frailty index, because it is objective. So speaking a little more in detail about the LFI, three tests are done, grip strength, time chair stance, and balance testing happens. Grip strength, three trials are done, measured in the subject's dominant hand with a hand dynamometer. Time chair stance are measured the number of seconds it takes to do five chair stints with the subject's arms folded across the chest. And balance testing is the number of seconds that the subject can balance in three positions for a maximum of 10 seconds each. When we have all these, you can enter into the calculator that are liverfrailtyindex.ucsf.edu, where you get a frailty score. This is a KPS scale. It's been widely used. It's easier to adopt and quicker, easier for the patient to do it. But the problem is it is subjective. So when you compare these three, uh, the LFI versus KPS, the frailty index is a multi-dimensional construct of frailty. So it, it measures everything. Grip strength, with this index of malnutrition, chair stands is, is an index of muscle weakness and sarcopenia, balance, which is altered neuromotor coordination. So all concepts of, you know, all components of frailty are measured here. Whereas KPS only measures the functional status and is subjectable, subjective, susceptible to bias. LFI has external validity, non-serotic populations as well, and that's been widely studied. So this again is a study which compares uh, LFI and Karnowski's performance status with weightless mortality, a prospective study. And um, it has shown that frailty as measured by LFI may be more appropriate at capturing mortality risk, while KPS is not as good. And, and, uh, yeah, both of them are done in the outpatient setting. It's also important to stage the frailty to severe, moderate, and mild to address interventions for these patients. And each of the scores, each of the scales that we have, ADL, CFS, uh, fried frailty phenotype, they all give different scores and they stage frailty. Now, this is a, a important... Include. Yeah, I'll do that. Expert opinion from American Society of Transplantation, where they looked into frailty and liver transplant, and they have made some recommendations. So frailty should not be used as a sole criteria for delisting a patient for liver transplant. It should be one of the many criteria when evaluating transplant candidacy and suitability. So this again, this is what I said, global assessment of transplant candidacy is what we're looking at. So these are the usual factors that we always look at it from the clinical point of view, but an add an objective frailty toolkit to identify the right patient for the transplant. And again, there is a, this is an algorithm that is proposed to trailer prehab recommendations. So mild or absent frailty, you the, treat them as a normal patient, you give them the normal exercise regimens as you'll do for non-liver patients and uh, proceed with liver transplant. Moderate frailty, you'll have to give home-based exercise and rehabilitation regimen and proceed with liver transplant. Severe frailty, a prehab program is very intense prehab program is required inactivate them on the wait list, reassess, and if they progress on to the next degree or they improve on to the moderate degree, then you offer them a transplant. So you are trying to improve the physiological reserves so that they can handle the stresses which happen in the perioperative period. So prehab program is both nutritional and exercise regimens. It's home-based. So you, you target patients with greatest functional impairment. Um, yeah, and aerobic training is also done. 
this is this is um, briefly oh, yes. talk about that. looking lovely thank you <laughs> guidelines on clinical nutrition oh, in the so they recommend that all patients need to be screened for malnutrition using a validated tool royal free hospital nutrition prioritization tool is well validated counseling has to be mandatory nutritional counseling is mandatory in patients to improve patient long term outcome and survival multidisciplinary care has to be provided and patients with liver disease also always should have a caloric intake of 30 to 35 kilo calories per kilogram in intake of 1.2 to 1.3 obese patients lifestyle interventions are very important as i said the disease can recur in the graft as well so intense lifestyle intervention should be targeted in these patients with both physical activity and restricted caloric intake and more protein intake so important facts to remember as i as i told in my first few slides limit periods of starvation when they are waiting for procedures keep to keep it to below 6 hours and uh, resume it as soon as possible when energy expenditure is high the resting energy expenditure is always high when they have complications supplement more because of sodium re restriction the palatability is going to be a problem you need to balance the risk and the benefit proteins should need not be avoided in hepatic encephalopathy as is always thought supplement all micronutrients and nocturnal feeds have also shown to improve the protein metabolism and is well established as a as a mode of uh, improving nutrition in these patients branch chain amino acids to be considered for patients who are protein intolerant just going through the same slides again uh, home exercise training this is again is a first randomized controlled trial which is uh, looked into patients um, with exercise therapy and without exercise therapy and they have shown that patients uh, who are given 8 weeks of home exercise therapy they they it's very safe and effective no adverse events have been noted it it is shown to improve the peak aerobic oxygen um, peak aerobic power the vo2 which is a which is a measure of exercise capacity and also the 6 minute 6 minute walk distance and the muscle mass no adverse events are noted this is a way forward in treating a patients so to conclude nutritional status uh, is one of the components of physical frailty and it underlines all other components as well so it's a very important predictor of post transplant outcomes and survival on the wait list improvements in the frailty scores have shown good improvement in outcomes so that is where we have to target intense prehab can help improve transplant candidacy and also improve your perioperative outcomes thank you thanks for your patient listening sorry i took a little longer Thank you, Dr. Akira, for your comprehensive view on nutritional status in liver transplant. Uh, we'll straight away move to the third topic before we open for discussion. For the third topic, we have Dr. Sanjeev Anija with us. He's a senior consultant at Indraprasth Rapolo Hospital, New Delhi. Sir, you can take the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Piyush, for inviting me in this meeting and asking me to speak a very interesting title that is, Does Anesthesiologist Outdo the Pulmonologist in Pulmonary Assessment? When I got this topic, I got totally confused. Many days I could not think what to speak. I remember the similar topic was presented in 2014 IRTS guidelines, but what had been presented totally evaporated from my mind. But then I thought, the topic has been given, I should try to justify who is better anesthesiologist or pulmonologist in pulmonary assessment. In this post pulmonary complication after liver transplantations, they are very high. The incidence can be as much as 20 to 30%, which is much more than the cardiac complications. It is much more than the complications caused by thromboembolisms or DVTs, and uh, they can result in significant mor morbidity and mortality. And nowadays we know as the, <coughs> as Shweta was saying, the more difficult, the most challenging thing is, nowadays it is very difficult to explain to the family if anything happens. The major complications can be in the form of acute or worsening respiratory failure, or the patient requiring mechanical ventilation or intubation for more than 48 hours, or it could be just a clinically significant atelectasis. And then the other important thing and difficult thing is that the most important symptom of the pulmonary import involvement in the patients of chronic liver disease is dyspnea, which is very vague and very difficult to evaluate. 
Therefore, for pulmonary evaluation, you need a team. And both pulmonologists and anesthesiologists are the important member of the team. And I think in that team, every body, body is important. Nobody overdoes the other person. The arguments or probably the feed from each of person is important. And similarly, it holds good for pulmonologists and anesthesiologists. But definitely, but for the sake of title, I would like to try to justify it. Now, let us come to see how the liver and lung are closely involved. There are few diseases that affect both liver and lungs, like cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, HHT, sarcoidosis, or the lately COVID-19. And then there are few diseases which can coexist with the patients of liver disease, like asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We have a high incidence of the prevalence of these conditions in the society, and they can be associated with the patients of chronic liver disease when they come for surgery or the patients with pulmonary nodule or the interstitial lung disease. And then there are few pulmonary complications which the chronic liver disease causes, like hepatic hydrothorax, and then the very well-studied hepatopulmonary syndrome and the portopulmonary hypertension. Let me come to first start with the diseases that coexist with the liver disease, like the bronchial asthma. This is a chronic inflammatory disorder with reversible airflow obstruction and bronchial hyperactivity. No study has been done to investigate the influence of asthma alone on the outcome of patients after liver transplantations. I think probably in this, the anesthesiologist outdoes the pulmonologist in the perioperative management and assessment because of his additional knowledge of procedures and the drugs which are likely to cause bronchospas. And then in the routine practice also, he is likely in other surgeries also know how to prevent or evaluate these patients. Then come patients with the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the COPD. It is different completely from bronchial asthma. This is a progressive disease, which is characterized by the non-reversible airway limitations which are caused by mucus hypersecretions and inflammation. And it is found approximately in 18% of the cases awaiting liver transplantation and 80% of them are newly diagnosed, that they have been diagnosed when probably the workup for transplantation started, and the smoking is significantly associated with these patients. The survival rate in transplanted patients have been found similar to a patients who are not suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And this is one of the most recent studies done in Spain from, for 14 years, they tried to find what is the effect of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease on the outcome in patients after liver transplantation? They found that patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are very few, only mild and moderate disease patients are being taken. Severe patients are always being diffused. And these patients are elder as compared to the patients who do not have COPD, but they found that the in-hospital mortality is not different. But the most important thing, which has probably not been reported in this study, is what is the hospital stay, what is the difficulty in weaning in these patients, and what is the other morbidity. And we also know that probably the pulmonary function test and the spirometry is the backbone or the cornerstone of the diagnostic evaluation. And this only not tells about us about the what is the nature of the disease. It tells us about the reversibility and the progression. And the other thing probably which could helpful in these patients are diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide and pulse oximetry and arterial blood tests. And the staging is done according to American Thoracic Society, that is stage one, FEV1 50%, stage two, 36 to 50%, and the stage three, 35 to 35%. There are no specific guidelines to say what COPD, what level of FEV1 is not advanced to preclude safe delivery. <laughs> Let us first again go that probably the problem with FEV1, if it is used as a test for the severity, is that it is only telling you about the one thing, whereas for to predict the effect of COPD on the perioperative mortality, you need a comprehensive score and the board score, which is very well used, is the body mass index, the degree of airflow obstruction, dyspnea, or the six-minute walking test is combined to know what is the predictivity and what is the chance of death in these patients? This was in rough talking about 
the COPD. Now come to the question of pulmonologist versus anesthesiologist in COPD. For the life, we have always been trained that a chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and the asthma, these are the three things which are interrelated, interrelated. But over the period of time, this has become more interrelated and more complex, and they have been subdivided. The what bronchial asthma probably we know consists of only of subdivide only the segment nine, whereas it is all interrelated. And secondly, therefore, the anesthesiologist with pure reversibility may be better only for this nine, whereas all these things are very closely interrelated. And the more important thing is that the progress of disease. We probably try to do a one-time cross-sectional examination, but the more important in these patients is to have a longitudinal assessment because they keep on shifting from one thing to other. And this here, probably the pulmonologist feed would be very important who has been seeing this patient. And I think the pulmonologist would outdo the uh, anesthesiologist in the assessment of the patient of COPD in these patients. Now come to the restrictive lung disease. You can find a patient of restrictive lung disease. This is probably one of the latest article, very prospective study of the patient of restrictive lung disease. And they have found that uh, restrictive lung disease is found in approximately 18% of the cases. And these patients are associated with increased mortality. And they are also associated with uh, functional impairment also. And the restriction is mostly attributed to the pleural effusion and ascites. But if you see in detail, the pleural effusion and ascites are responsible only for two third of cases. In the one third of cases, the restriction is difficult to explain. It could be the small element, could be because of frailty, because of, because of weakness of the respiratory muscle. But on the other hand, there is a significant portion, or maybe I would say that 20%, the restrictive lung disease is very difficult to say. And here, that this could be because of interstitial lung disease, which is a though it is only a small proportion in a patient coming for surgery. But on the other hand, it is progressive, it is inflammatory, it is difficult to it is difficult to diagnose. And here, you would need a feed from the pulmonologist. Similarly, you can find a patient with pulmonary nodule. Six percent of the patient coming for pre-liver transplant evaluation would have a, some pulmonary nodule, which needs to be differentiated from the metastatic tumor of SCC, pleural tumor, or it can be of infectious etiology. And probably it would be difficult on the basis of CT scan or MRI alone to diagnose these patients. And probably you would need a, need a bronchoscopic guided biopsy, which comes in the purview of pulmonology. And I would say probably the feed of pulmonology is also involvement at that time. And if restrictive lung disease, I come, which who is more important, anesthesiologist versus pulmonologist, I would say yes, in most of the cases, 75% or 80% of the cases, it is an anesthesiologist who would outdo the pulmonologist. But there are 15 to 20% of the patients with inter interstitial lung disease with, with incidental pulmonary nodule, where probably the diagnosis would be based only upon the input of the pulmonologist. Now come to the disease that affect both liver and lung, like sarcoidosis. It is a multi-systemic disorder characterized by granuloma formation. The pulmonary system involvement is the most common side of activity. Hepatic involvement can be there, but it can be in the 70% of the cases, and out of them, only 10 to 15% with portal hypertension would require liver transplantation. And you need the involvement of pulmonologists, pulmonologists to see the input and regarding the severity of the disease process. Similarly, cystic fibrosis in the small number of patients, the both liver and lung are totally involved. And the pulmonary disease is the main cause of mortality and morbidity. The liver is affected in 30% of the cases and out of them 10% of require liver transplantation. And it requires retail pulmonary evaluation. It requires whether you would do one organ or you would transplant two organs. And for this also, probably the pulmonologist input would be more than the pulmonologist input, than the anesthesiologist input. And similarly, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is an autosomal dominant disorder leading to abnormal production of the protein. And it leads to pulmonary emphysema in lungs and cirrhosis of liver and carcinoma of the liver. 
and the pulmonology involvement in helpful for deciding the optimum time of transplantation and the decision regarding whether it would be a combined or a single transplantation. And nowadays, the COVID-19, the COVID-19 has changed everything. You can get a patient who has a pulmonary involvement. A pulmonary involvement can be in the, in the form of ground glass appearance, incidental. It could be, could be in the form of some remaining ARDS. It could be long COVID. You can see a lot of things, pulmonary fibrosis. Therefore, probably you have to take the opinion of pulmonology. Probably it would be important. And now I come to the few things which have been discussing hepatopulmonary syndrome. Dr. Bora discussed. I, I unfortunately missed it. And <laughs> these type of patients, there, there, there would be not much pulmonary important. XHS would be okay. You won't find anything except carbon monoxide transfer defect can be there if you do the detailed pulmonary function test. And there is no medical management. And this is the basically of disease of pulmonary vessels. I, prob I think probably here the pulmonologist input would not be of a, that important for the suitability of surgery. It would be anesthetist who would be more important because he knows how to manage this case. The basic challenge is to oxygen therapy and to, there are various forms to provide oxygen therapy, which is more in the purview of the anesth anesthesiologist than in the pulmonology and the management of hypoxemia is very complex. It requires getting epopressinol, nitric oxide, changing the position and doing a lot of things. Probably the anesthesiologist would be better to handle and understand to know the suitability of these type of cases. Similarly, the pulmonary artery hypertension in liver transplant patients. This is also, uh, if, it is, if it is because of uh, POPH, probably it comes into, into the category of the anesthesiologist, but a very small portion of portion of cases, the pulmonary artery hypertension could be because of associated interstitial lung disease or sleep disorders where anesthesiologist, where the pulmonologist input would be very important. So therefore, I conclude that the anesthesiologist and pulmonologist, both are important members of team for pulmonary assessment. They outdo each other at the various phases in the assessment of the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, sir. Uh, your talk is always uh, gives some knowledge to us to move forward. And uh, I'll request a chairperson to start the discussion. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Shweta is not available. Uh, she is busy in the case. So Dr. Akila and Dr. Aneja is available for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, this is Dr. C. K. Pandey. Hi, Dr. Pandey. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm fine, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Akila. Uh, basically, the use about the protein in hepatic encephalopathy. It is uh, established fact that people are using. In, uh, protein uh, even during hep hepatic encephalopathy. So that is the recommended dose is nearly uh, up to the one gram per kg body weight. So from your presentation, uh, does B use the uh, albumin or whatever the protein supplements be required for the hepatic encephalopathy patients? So that is what is the cutoff value? How much protein B can use liberally in such patients? Now the, the restriction I mentioned about was in the oral route that you give. So ideally you give 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram. Earlier practice used to be to withhold um, proteins because you think that is contributing to encephalopathy. It's not shown to do so. And also in acute liver failure, earlier um, protein restriction used to be a, a practice. Now it's not recommended anymore. Um, about the... Uh, I mean, there, there are no uh, restrictions on the use of albumin in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. It's about what you take. No, no, uh, I was talking about the, uh, uh, oral protein. That is one uh, major person used to be earlier to be. But now uh, people are using albumin, uh, sorry, protein for the uh, internal supplementation. But uh, uh, few studies came and they recommend that is 0.5 to 1 gram per kg body weight protein can be supplemented for such patients, there is no restriction, but can be liberally use protein in such patients or not? That is the question. Uh, 
that, that is what the espen guidelines also uh, recommend actually you can use up to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day okay my second question to you only <laughs> that is uh, uh, though these patients they are sarcopenic they are malnourished and there are big muscle mass and so many things are there and to improve the clinical condition we require much time for in, in preparing these patients for the transplantation so there is any rapid or uh, method of optimization such patients so they can be scheduled early for the transplant I'm not sure if there is a rapid method that can happen. I mean, it, it is going to be a both uh, nutrition regimen optimization as well as exercise regimen. Uh, recently, exercise regimens have come into play, at least in our part of the country. Um, I, I don't think any rapid method is possible. I think each patient also takes his own. Uh, I have to use the wrong word rapid, but is there any fast method uh, which uh, less time is required for optimization mm -hmm. of such patients? Nocturnal feeds have shown to improve uh, you know, the weight gain a little more rapidly compared to others. We, have, uh, we do it in most of our malnourished patients and we see better outcomes. But uh, I, we don't have a comparative thing to say, which is which can do better in terms of time. But nocturnal feeding does improve um, uh, the rate at which the, you know, the nutritional status can be optimized. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Anija. Hi, Dr. Arora. Hi, how are you? Uh, I want to ask you one uh, query for my information that uh, like all the patients of uh, liver transplant are referred to pulmonologists by the surgeons as a routine protocol that they should be seen by the pulmonologist. It has happened to us that many times their opinion have misguided us and patient have more severe issue than the pulmonologist was able to understand it. So looking at this, is it, uh, what is the protocol? Uh, should we now uh, transfer, I mean, take the opinion for all the patients or uh, should we be selective in asking the pulmonologist opinion and some of the issues which you have already raised? If the decision to refer the patient lies on us instead of surgeon, I would like it to make it very selective. As I said, like if you're dealing with a patient who is you're finding a pulmonary function test of uh, restrictive lung disease and you can you think probably you can explain it by means of ascites and pleural effusion mm -hmm. and there is no interstitial lung disease or pulmonary nodule or anything probably you may not should not be referring this patient to the mm -hmm. pulmonologist but yes if you find something interstitial lung disease or pulmonary nodule, nodule mm -hmm. which probably is could be the cause of restriction yes you should and your first, what you said is probably, yeah, pulmonologists, if all patients are referred, it can be misleading, yes, because they do not have that much idea of various techniques of oxygen therapy. They probably would give some time, say that uh, you can take, a, take the patient to theater, which probably would be difficult to maintain in theater, because we know that the theater anesthesia machines are not that powerful to give a complex form of respiratory pain the duration and then the positioning of the patient and the putting of the detractor, you know, that things are more complex than probably pulmonologists know, but yes, but on the other hand, for diagnosis of few things, they are important, only selective. No, no actually before the patient comes to us many times, surgeon uh, refers, you know, routine reference to cardiology, pulmonologist, and uh, then one got, uh, you know, biased by their opinion. And that has led to a uh, few different times to handling the situation in the theater. I know, I know, I know. Uh, then if they agree, they shouldn't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Do we have your any doctor? Here, you're not audible. Please unmute. Dr. Thir, you are not audible. Oh, sorry. Good morning. This is uh, Ashil Dheer. Yes. Eight o'clock in the morning here. And uh, I really enjoyed three talks, Dr. Neja, Dr. Akila, and uh, uh, Shweta's. And uh, I have basically not any question or any comment because they were very well covered. 
Uh, just uh, Dr. Neja said that uh, who is better, pulmonologist or anesthesiologist? In in my humble opinion, I think both of them are collaborative rather than competitive. Few things which anesthesiologists can manage much better than uh, respirologists or pulmonologists, especially in the operating room, like the ventilation, ventilator mode, and because there, there, there are some dynamic changes happening in the operating room. Patient is bleeding, patient is hypotensive, we give certain drugs, so lots of things happening. And I think in acute phase, anesthesiologists definitely play a bigger role. And when we talk about the chronic, for example, acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, I think anesthesiologists are the best people to manage that. And when you talk about chronic pulmonary hypertension when patient is in the clinic, and uh, then uh, already diagnosed, but not in the operating room. In those situations, I think the respirologists are in the better position to put them on some anti-endothelin blocking agent like Emrysenton and all that thing for long term. So I think it is always a team effort, which is a collaborative approach. And we should take the best from every possible person. And uh, for Dr. Lakla, again, it was a very nice talk. Uh, my only comment or question is, uh, I don't know as anesthesiologist, where do we stand? Can we cancel a patient when we see them in the clinic that patient appears too, too frail? Uh, I mean, uh, we are not uh, nutritionists. We send them to the say, nutritional uh, expert and uh, they do their changes. So we cannot recommend what nutrition what doses or what particular uh, things we have our patient. It's only in the intensive care period where we can have a little bit of control of uh, nutrition. So it's more of a comment. I really don't know how much role anesthesiologists play in the preoperative assessment of uh, a liver transplant patient as far as nutrition we, is. We do have a very big role. We, we, are, we should be able to say no to such patients, actually. We are going to see the outcomes post-op. We are in a better position to advise our surgeons and the team. Um, you know, a good team will always understand. Uh, we can't, uh, we can't uh, I mean, not all of us can advise nutrition regimens, but we have to, uh, we have a duty to refer them to a nutrition therapist to decide on uh, optimization. And obviously, post-operatively, if we are going to look after patients, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. You, you will not be able to extubate them early. They're going to be in bed for a long time, more chances of sepsis and all of those things. So we, we should use a window to optimize them, is what I feel. I mean, we um, I have the luxury of looking after them pre-op and post-op because I look after both theater and ICU. So... Akhila, what percentage of your patients preoperatively would be able to do the performance tests that you've spoken about? I the, think my, I think, LFI test? 25, 30, yeah. The yeah. kind of the, the performance. Yeah. LFI is, is, done, is, is part of our uh, transplant protocol, the pre-op evaluation protocol. And I think 85% 80, uh, do, uh, do perform that. I mean, we're going, doing a study on that. So at least 85% complete that. We don't have trouble in them doing. I mean, the scores will be less, but uh, there's no in inability to perform is not there. Thank you. Akila, is there any recommended uh, waiting period or endpoint of optimization, particularly in the context of LDLT settings? Um, at the end of the day, I strongly feel if there is a contraindication for transplant, not it. There is. I mean, not everybody should be transplanted. If you cannot achieve some goals. We have to we have to be open with the patient and explain all the you know uh, problems of doing it in this stage, all the outcomes, and patients do understand. Those of who can wait should wait. Is what we feel. We've seen the worst outcomes with the uh, very malnourished patients, but the ones who come in with ACLF and all those where uh, the risk versus benefits are on the side of doing a transplant earlier, then we go ahead and do. But other patients who can wait should definitely wait. Thank you all. Uh, it was all a very wonderful presentation. So thanks all the esteemed speakers and the panelists. And thank, the thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Now we are moving to the next session. That is a case discussion. We as an anesthesiologist uh, definitely come across some difficult cases very frequently. So we had uh, two difficult cases uh, where we have to decide uh, uh, medically and ethically both. And uh, we will discuss these two cases. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Be moderating this session. He is a senior consultant, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care in the First Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. I will invite the panelists, Anandita Mukherjee. She is consultant, HPB and multi-organ transplant anesthesiology, Apollo Hospital, Bangalore. Vijay Kant Pandey, senior consultant, anesthesia and critical care, CLBS Max Hospital, New Delhi. Selva Kumar, he is uh, head of the department, liver anesthesia and critical care, Global Hospital, Chennai. And uh, Anil Agrawal. He himself is a consultant, senior consultant, liver transplant and assistant critical care at Fortis Group of the Hospital, uh, Delhi and CR. So for uh, discussing the first case, I'd like to invite Amit, uh, Dr. Amit Jha. He is a consultant, uh, anesthesia and critical care at Fortis Hospital, Delhi and CR. So Amit, discuss the first case. So uh, this is the first case among in a panel discussion. Uh, for the first case, we have a 46-year-old male. He was weighing 126 kg with a BMI of 43.1. When he was admitted, his primary complaint was shortness of breath, abdominal distension, and loss of appetite. On evaluation, he was diagnosed to uh, have uh, NASH with CLD. And his primary recompensation was a history of HE, HRS, ascites, and hyponatremia. And there was no history of SBP and GI bleed. In his... Uh, uh, medical history is a known case of coronary artery disease and with uh, angioplasty in 2008. He had been taken uh, ecosprin and clopidogrel, uh, clopidogrel since then and he had stopped it two years back when he was diagnosed with CLD. There's no other significant medical history, drug allergy, personal or family history. Patient is not an alcoholic. Uh, in the pre-op, it was on, on admission, it was found that the sodium levels were around 108 and the creatinine was 1.62. His hemogram was within normal limits. Ana was 2.9, bilirubin 3.7. The patient was started on albumin and terlipresent medication. His diuretics were stopped and acetic tapping was done. Patient was put on broad anti antibiotic and antifungal. Gradually, his sodium improved to 118 over the next three days. However, his creatinine uh, continued to increase and he was not responsive to early present albumin treatment. He had a, a urine output of 15 to 20 ml per hour. On eco, his PSP was 54 with a dilated LA and the ABG suggested of metabolic acidosis. Dr. Ashish. Can we have Dr. Ashish, panelist? Hi. Oh, sorry. I think uh, there was a loss in the... Okay, so uh, thank you, Piyush, for having me as a moderator. And I can see the expert panel of uh, experts around me. And we started with this case discussion. And uh, I would just... Uh, this is a very interesting case they brought up. And uh, to put the slide back, can you put the slide back, please? Is this yeah. one okay? So maybe we can move on to the next one. So the first thought uh, which I had seen this case was the BMI. So I would just open up to the panel, uh, Dr. Anandita, Dr. Sharmila, and Vijay, and uh, Anil, as well as uh, I think Dr. Selva. So uh, what are your thoughts on taking this BMI at 43.1? Do we have a cutoff for it or what are the issues which you could think of? 
Um, Anybody, please? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ashish, I would like to take the answer. Uh, nowadays, with uh, the expanding criteria of donors and recipients that we are taking, we do face with people who are having such a high BMI. So only thing what we have to keep in mind is these patients when, uh, may have something like a metabolic syndrome. These people are more uh, prone to be diabetic, hypertensive, and uh, most of the patients, uh, the graft might uh, work out to be less for these patients uh, post-transplant. Other than that, most of these patients are also prone to infections and all post-transplant. Uh, pulmonary complications may be more. So it might be difficult for us to do it. So maybe the cardiac and pulmonary assessment also has to be more stricter in these patients. So going by this patient who is a NASH patient, though he's a younger patient uh, but with a higher BMI, I would still go with a very aggressive uh, cardiopulmonary evaluation in this patient before taking him to the transport. Right. So that's a nice thought. Uh, and then uh, uh, maybe the next uh, topic. May I add something, Dr. Ashish? Yeah, please do. Yeah. And one thing we must keep in mind that uh, BMI in a case of cirrhotic patients sometimes be misleading. Sometimes due to massive ascites and fluid overload, they can present as a morbid obesity, but on drainage of ascites or on use of CRRT, they can come to a lower BMI. Obviously, the morbid obesity patient would have uh, post-op morbidity and mortality very high compared to a non-obese cirrhotic patient undergoing transplant. But the issue of BMI as a for diagnosis of morbid obesity in a cirrhotic patient uh, is a bit misleading. So uh, do we have a consensus or uh, what is followed in your institution? Any cutoff value of BMI? If we just talk of the CRV. Use a cutoff of more than 30 as obese, but it's not uh, a true indicator. And most of these patients will also be sarcopenic in because of the cirrhosis. So many of them, if we follow the strict guidelines, they can be either uh, a sarcopenic obese, particularly this patient might be a sarcopenic obese patient as well. So uh, <laughs> weakness as well as visceral adipose tissue being more, so he's obese as well as sarcopenic. So we do, we just from a BMI, we won't be able to classify him as a morbidly obese. Fine. Can I add something? Ashish, yeah. can I add something? Yeah. Yeah, see, this patient, for, uh, this patient is falling in the category of morbid obesity. And other than cardiac and respiratory problems, we have to also concern, have, uh, have to be concerned about the difficult intubation thing and positioning of the patient during operation. So while selecting this patient, we have to keep this in mind that this patient will have difficult mask um, ventilation, uh, difficult laryngoscopy and intubation also. And the same thing applies post-operatively while weaning them off ventilator that we have to keep in mind that uh, they may need prolonged ventilatory support and a difficult intubation cart has to be kept ready uh, while extubating these patients. These right. patients also have OSA, so in that case, we have to keep a ramped up position while intubating the patient. So all these things also we have to keep in mind while taking up such patients. We have done one case of uh, liver transplantation along with sleeve gastrectomy where the patient was morbidly obese and BMI of 46. And right. we have taken all these cares and it really matters during the intraoperative period. Thank you, Dr. Sharmila. And uh, if we can move on to the next uh, point. And uh, it's just that uh, it's the management which uh, these guys did was CRRT. So any views on that? Any thoughts on uh, use of CRRT? Until the point of the presentation. Uh, I think uh, CRRT was the best uh, in current scenario of patient. Because we have tried the telepressin and albumin and his urine output not increased and creatinine decreased, increase, creatinine increased. So uh, CRRT will uh, take care of volume overload and it will relieve the symptom and it will further optimize the patient for the uh, further management basically. So CRRT is the best, best choice in current scenario. Okay. Anything more? And also for the case of uh, like uh, optimization of hyponatremia, I think CRRT yeah. in this case is a better option with uh, hyponatremia along with a raised creatinine. Yes. So 
CRRT would serve as a good optimization both for hyponatremia and the AKI. So, uh, can I add I something? To, uh, I tend to disagree on this point. I tend to disagree on this point that CRRT is better for uh, hyponatremia correction because most of the dilysate uh, and replacement fluid have sodium concentration of 140 milliequivalent per liter. And it will lead to rapid change in uh, serum sodium and it will change your serum sodium more than 12 milliequivalent per liter within uh, 24 hours. So uh, for this there is some modification suggested in CRRT. Uh, these fluids, uh, dialysis fluids should be hypotonic, contain, should contain low sodium by uh, modification in uh, our own ICU. And uh, CRRT rate should be optimized to maintain the serum sodium. If we can do this, then CRRT is the best thing to correct hyponatremia. So I think you have a valid point there. And maybe when we move on to the next slide, we can see what was the shift in sodium uh, in their case. The last point uh, which I would like to uh, hold on to is, uh, would you do for them? Would you spend this way? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, would you do a swan for this patient based on the preliminary data which we have presented? No, I don't think uh, um, we would consider swan for this patient. This this patient has, I think, a clinical picture of volume overload with AK and oliguria. Yeah. So we are all to, we are all going to see only elevated wedge pressure in this. Uh, so I don't think swan guns would be a big option here. Right. So, Amit, can we move on to the next uh, part of the presentation? Yeah, sure. Um, you want to discuss something on this one? I think let's go on to the next one. Okay. Uh, the patient was consulted for uh, urgent liver transplant and his uh, entire transplant evaluation was completed. If the patient was taken for uh, CRRT and uh, post 48 hours of CRRT, the patient was hemodynamically stable. Uh, his hemogram was okay. Creatinine came down to 1.8. Sodium came up to 127. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, no. Your slides, slides are. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, even uh, the uh, entire blood urine acetic culture sensitivity was sterile. On 2D echo, there was improvement. The PSP came down to 36. The patient was taken up for an LDT and the Donor was uh, the patient's five, 41 year old, ASA grade one patient. The duration of surgery was six hours, 40 minutes, and GRWR was only 0.6. Uh, during the surgery, the blood loss was for, of 1.5 liters. Ascitis was collected 5.5 liters. Urine output during the surgery was only 50 ml. Coagulopathy, coagulopathy was uh, managed uh, <laughs> by Rotem. The patient received five units of PRBC and uh, during the surgery, the patient was on very high vasopressor support. So uh, I think the panel can take up the next part of the use of intraoperative CRRT. So are you, do you agree with the point that uh, how they have uh, managed intraoperatively? Yeah, I think they've managed this patient well. I mean, a patient who had improved pre-op with the CRRT, we've seen an improvement in the creatinine and the sodium. And uh, since the patient seems to be totally oliguric, then I would have also continued with the CRRT intraoperatively and probably postoperatively for some time till the thing stabilizes in this patient. So, right. uh, any uh, other comments on the intraoperative management? Yeah, we take a call on this um, intraoperative CRRT based on uh, two major things. One is the volume, obviously, uh, the volume and the space for the kidneys to you know produce some urine. So uh, basically, running a CRRT when you have a massive transfusion or uh, any significant fluid, fluid shifts during the tra transplant, it gives us some space to handle the volume. If you don't have a uh, CRRT in a patient who is oliguric, uh, that might create problems. The other thing is the metabolic demands. In ALF, of course, we definitely continue for the purpose of removing ammonia. Uh, acidosis and potassium very rarely have been the indications to continue in drop CRRT. Mainly it's volume, if you look at it. Yeah. And uh, uh, I saw another point of the GRWR in yeah. this presentation. So is everybody happy with that or with the 
I think considering everything, this is yeah, the best number of toys, right? I would say. <laughs> <laughs> that was. So, if suppose you have a BMI of more than forty-five, oh. be uh, misleading. Uh, remove fact for the, the serotonin. BMI itself might be uh, miscalculated. Yeah. yeah. So I think Anil is sitting in the audience, yeah. so he can take this point up. Anil? Yes, sir. So, uh, I think the BMI it's, uh, itself uh, could be a misleading factor because the because of the fluid overload which might have got optimized by the CRRT pre-op and mm -hmm. the uh, ascites that was drained during the transplant. So, actual GRWR might be different from the from that based on the graft weight only. Right. I think as long as the graft quality is good, uh, this number might be good enough. Good enough. So that's what I think. So any uh, comments on the part of uh, the patient we done in 2008 and uh, we would eco as numbers. Anything else the expert would suggest? Are you happy with the 2D eco itself? Uh, patient bedridden or? The patient was better. Okay. So, would you uh, like to have anything else to be done, or it's okay to proceed? So, we uh, we can consider since this patient is obese, and uh, I mean, normally the cutoff for doing an angiogram will be someone more than sixty years or uh, someone more than fifty years with a lot of comorbidities. But particularly in this patient, then we are seeing that he's already uh, quite obese, and he has a lot of uh, co I mean. His condition is not that very stable, and uh, with a PTC, sometime I mean, quite some time ago, we would have probably gone with a CT angio or a coronary angio and evaluated it. So, uh, can we discuss the next point of the presentation, Amit? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I would like the expert opinion on uh, the anticoagulation. Or, first of all, I'll ask maybe ask them what they did, and then. Uh, or the expert advice on anticoagulation in this patient, post-operative. In the uh, post-operative uh, period, uh, there was a difficult weaning in this uh, patient. The patient was, uh, we were not able to extubate him for the next three, four days. The patient underwent a tracheostomy on day five. He was uh, put on uh, multi-broad spectrum antibiotics and antifungal. He required vasopressors for the next uh, five days and gradually it was weaned off. He required CRRT for post-operative period seventh day and uh, the fluid uh, management was mostly restrictive based on uh, his input output and that's why how he managed it. And what about the anticoagulants? Anticoagulants uh, for this patient, uh, initially heparin was, uh, no. Dr. Ashish, yeah. actually this patient was on the CRT for initial five days. Mm. So he was anyway very coagulopathic uh, after the transplant because he was on the very high vasopressor supports. He was on the double inotropic supports. And uh, throughout these five, six days, his uh, rotam was pretty uh, deranged. Pretty deranged yeah. and he was actually, uh, because of the extracorporeal circulation uh, in form of CRT, his, his platelet functions were very uh, bad. So he, in fact, required some uh, uh, platelet support. And uh, uh, during the CRT, his drain also became little red. So he required some crab precipitate. But yes, one CRT got stopped uh, on day five. After that, his platelet started rising up very pretty fast and Rotam started getting corrected. So we put, on, uh, put him on uh, some anticoagulation in the form of uh, low molecular weight heparin on day seven. And then we put him on antiplatelet because he was uh, anyway a coronary artery disease patient, pretty obese. And uh, as his uh, coagulation system was you know, getting corrected very fast, so we put him on antiplatelet agent of, uh, on day 10. So that was the uh, anticoagulation we did uh, in this patient. Fine. So uh, any other comments from the so, uh, The anticoagulation in CRRT, actually, I think um, I would agree with the Piyush in a post-op situation. Uh, many times we don't, uh, we, we end up not giving anything. We just give a free blood pump uh, saline to just, you know, dilute the blood in the, in the, in the cartridge, in the data state. 
but uh, if um, if the numbers are good we can consider giving a small dose of unfractionated heparin infusion into the filter which will also give some element of uh, systemic anticoagulation something like 250 to 500 units per hour of uh, uh, infusions, but uh, but again uh, with this patient with the borderline GRWR and uh, uh, significant transfusions uh, and uh, with the uh, CRRT causing a you know contact activation and uh, thrombocytopenia, protein based uh, correction or uh, treatment would be ideal, which is what I think they did. So it's all thumbs up to them to manage this case. Yep. <laughs> okay. So can we move on to the next one? We'll move on to the next case. For next case, we have Dr. Swill Rodriguez with us. She's a consultant, uh, anesthesia and critical care. What is group of hospitals? Nancia. So our next case is this 45 year old uh, gentleman who is a known case of uh, hcv related uh, end stage liver disease his decompensations are in the form of ascites pedal edema hepatic encephalopathy and coagulopathy he, he had no history of sbp or gi bleed uh, systemic illnesses were in the form of hypertension and no other significant history his investigations were as follows his uh, HB was 7.6, TLC 9,000, platelet count was 51,000, bilirubin total of 10.3 and direct 1.7, OTPT 71, 31, albumin of 2.9, renal functions were largely normal, magnesium of 1.7, INR of 2.2 and APTT of 34. He was uh, HCV positive, HCV RNA was less than 15, rest of the viral markers were non-reactive. So to summarize, this is a 45 year old Indian gentleman with HCV related end stage liver disease treated because his HCV RNA was not detected. His decompensations were in the form of ascites, pedal edema, hepatic encephalopathy and coagulopathy. Hypertensive, he was a hypertensive. So he, is, he was a child C, CTP score of 12, melt sodium of 30. He was planned for transplant at a later date, but subsequently he had to be readmitted on a, uh, at a later date with uh, complaints of slurring of speech, headache, vertigo, and ataxia. He had no history of fall. His GCS was 12 and his hemodynamically was stable. On admission, his hemoglobin was 6.5, platelet count of 46,000, INR of 2.4, bilirubin of 10 per 10.9, Creatinine was normal and ammonia was 43. Dr. Ashish. Hi, Suvil. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I have never encountered such a case till now, but uh, hats off to you to bring this up. I think it's a very interesting thing. So uh, in the panel, uh, uh, do you think it's a T or neurological even just to have a starters on with this case? Sir, it could be either of the two. Right. So we have to probably rule out doing a proper neurological evaluation. So since he's got ataxia and a lot of, uh, lot of neurological symptoms, so probably we'll have to evaluate him with a CT or MRI brain. So if it uh, all that turns out normal, HE will be a good diagnosis. But uh, uh, for this, it tends to be more like a neurological event. So we might find something in the MRI or CT brain, I think. So if we move on to the next slide soon. Yeah. So we did an MRI brain and it showed a large acute hematoma measuring 3.7 by 4.4 by 3.4 centimeters within the cerebellum with a mass effect with compression of the fourth ventricle. Fine. So the panel, the expert opinion, will you do a transplant for this patient? He is still a candidate for liver transplantation, but we need to sort, sort out neurological uh, thing first. Right. So, uh, what to sort out neurosurgeon must have been. Uh, actually, we encountered a case, but it was not in posterior fossa, it was in cerebrum. So, uh, we did CT, there was a midline shift, 
we uh, uh, called neurosurgeon they uh, they find that the patient should not be operated okay. and uh, we waited till 72 hours and then we repeated ct scan uh, with consultation with neurosurgeons and uh, after 72 hours hematoma was stabilized and uh, midline shift was not increased and patient clinical status was not deteriorated so we uh, neurosurgeons uh, cleared the patient for liver transplantation but we f- waited further so but in posterior fossa uh, it is actually small space and they there may be this may be the life threatening emergency to operate uh, so neurosurgeon opinion matters in this case uh, in posterior fossa cases uh, where they whether they want to operate or not operate and uh, yes. likelihood of spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage in uh, end stage liver disease is very low it is only 0.7% and uh, there should not be routine ct test for uh, icu management however if patient is going for transplant because of high stakes are involved in transplant then we can do routine ct before uh, transplant in patient who have altered mental status or hepatitis hepatic encephalopathy gate 2 3 okay. and uh, thanks vijay and dr shalma you uh, take it dr ashish may i add yeah yeah please yeah. Yeah. it's a difficult choice is not definitely a good candidate for ldlt but considering that uh, it's a, as dr vijay khan said that considering it's a posterior fossa bleed he might not survive without a neurosurgical intervention and he might not tolerate the neurosurgical intervention considering his mild sodium of 30 so mm-hmm. uh, a multidisciplinary consultation along with the discussion with the family uh, regarding all the risks and benefits to be weighed and also his post op quality of life which is very important for an ldlt where we are putting a donor under the knife so all these things need to be discussed amongst the team including the neurosurgical neuro intensive care team as well as the comprehensive liver transplant team and the family member separately a uh, decision has to be taken uh, according to the case yeah. i think uh, can i add something uh, i think uh, i would i would basically divide this into two parts one is the management of this um, neurological problem which is acute issue here uh, i don't think uh, we can we can combine the decision of transplant at this point along with the neurological intervention all we need to do now, right now is to sort out his neurology and once that is done say with the evacuation decompression or a conservative management then we think about the the you know, transplant candidacy so those in that situation we basically think about what is his residual deficit which is there after the uh, the recovery and then what is the chance of him having the bleed again what is the chance that it is due to a vascular pathology say for example you might need a angiogram uh, or is it a spontaneous bleed and uh, and and is there any other uh, implications like what is the chance of patient having a perioperative seizures because there is some lysis or some irritant there and all those things but so i would what I, we would probably think about is to sort out the neurology give a time a gap and then take up uh, for transplant provided we we are happy with this the, the few things even i uh, because the neurological status has to be corrected before taking the patient for transplant surgery because it's a living donor transplant we are uh, putting risk to the other patient also and uh, we don't know the progress prognosis of this patient after the neurological uh, uh, things are sorted out so first we need to see the uh, neurological status after neurosurgical uh, opinion or intervention is done and then i think we have to take this patient for transplant Uh, Dr. Ashish, I would like to add something. I, uh, uh, I agree with the point that this patient requires a craniotomy or a neurosurgical intervention definitely now because it's a posterior fossa involvement. But one thing we have to keep in mind is this is not a stable cirrhotic who has had a bleed that we can really wait for a longer time. This patient is going to, he's in an ACLF sort of a picture, so he's going to keep bleeding. So once we correct the coagulopathy, do the neurosurgical intervention, if we can correct the coagulopathy and he's stable for some time, neurologically better, he is definitely a patient whom we should consider doing an ldlt fast so that i mean so that we can prevent this sort of a picture again happening in him so suvil would you like to take uh, yeah yeah your view on this uh, point so uh, you want me to continue no, yeah uh, what was your uh, opinion that okay what we did here 
So we had a multidisciplinary team who was involved, the transplant surgeon, the anesthetist, the critical care team, the neurosurgery, and a detailed counseling of the donor and the kin was done, discussing the uh, survival, the length of stay, the monetary involvement. And finally, what we planned was uh, a craniotomy along with LDLT. So what we did was, should I continue? Yeah. So first, we, what we did was uh, we did a borehole with a, um, uh, a Omaya reservoir was inserted. And then we turned the patient so that to decrease the uh, CSF uh, uh, you know, pressure. And then the patient was turned prone and uh, we did a craniotomy, uh, occipital, sub, uh, occipital craniotomy. And then the patient was turned supine and LDLT was, uh, we did a transplant. Right. So that was what we did. And uh, did anybody in your team, the, uh, the thought crossed that you should give a time gap before you go on to the surgery? So, yeah. That is between the neurosurgical intervention and the liver transplant. Yeah, there was a detailed discussion in between the team members and the neurosurgical team that whether waiting for a day or for the neurological recovery before going ahead for a LDLT. But uh, considering... Uh, child C patient if he decompensates further and the neurological recovery also would be difficult to assess in this patient so sort and there are chances of re-bleed as well which would be catastrophic so we based on the neurosurgeon's uh, feedback and uh, team decision we decided to go ahead <coughs> with a <coughs> neurosurgical evacuation of the hematoma first and then depending on the intra findings and the, how sure the neurosurgeon was that there would be very less chance of a rebleed and the prognosis would be good, we went ahead with the transplant in the same setting. The mm -hmm. family was already explained that after the neurosurgical procedure, there might be a case that we defer the transplant or postpone it depending on what the neurosurgical team feels about the intra findings. Right. Uh, so I think the panel... Uh, has also given the views and that so we can talk about what do we have in the ROL, the review of literature. So, so uh, the review, the, uh, the literature in this regard is very ambiguous. So we have uh, Langman et al. Uh, who, you know, studied the survival outcomes after intracranial hemorrhage and liver disease. And he concluded that uh, intracranial hemorrhage in the setting of liver disease carries a grave prognosis and also the survival advantage with surgical hematoma evacuation in end stage liver disease is not clear so there is not there are not too much of evidence uh, literature based on the same right so i think so you... surgical mortality in chronic liver disease patient for surgical uh, intervention is around 50% and chances of rebleed in these cases are 36% which is pretty high so, uh, combined neurosurgical and liver transplant would be the bet, uh, best choice in this case, if relatives agree. So, uh, I think she's already detailed with the management. So, let's take up the next uh, part, that is the post-operative management of coagulation. So, what are the views of the house on the post-operative coagulation management? So for a neuro part, you need some parameters. Do we have a consensus on that? And for the vascular uh, things to keep on working in the liver, do we have a consensus on that? Okay. So uh, maybe Suvel can talk about what they yeah. did and we can have a... Yeah. So in the post-operative period, the coagulopathy uh, management, was, management was based on Rotem with the aim of having the platelet count more than 50,000 and the INR of less than two. On day one, uh, CT head was done, which showed a rebleed. The GCS worsened. This was managed with external drainage of the CSA for the next five days to keep the intracranial pressure low. The patient regained consciousness on POD3. He underwent an elective tracheostomy on POD4. Post operative CT head on POD15 revealed a near total resolution uh, of the hydrocephalus and residual hematoma, and he was discharged on day 25. Great job. So, uh, any consensus guidelines on how, because I am at loss. One of the new surgeons which here would like an INR of 1.2 and for LDLT is not even bothered. So, do we have any consensus looking at this case that 
platelet count of such and such and INR between this and this or anything in the literature which you must have searched up so will no actually there was not too much available on the literature except for the one which I have described Langman et al only had another cohort study which also you know was uh, the the uh, result was ambiguous so there was not too much that I know Actually, sir, whatever literature is available is only on neurosurgical interventions yeah, in cirrhotic patients. None of them, uh, I think, has been done in a post-transplant patient or uh, during a transplant. So the post-op coagulation management should also be, uh, like consideration of a liver transplant should also be in mind mm -hmm. while managing the coagulopathy. So the threshold should be a bit different than the conventional post-transplant patient. But... Uh, that's why probably INR less than 2 and not less than 1.5. Otherwise, uh, hepatic arterial issues may might yes. also be there. Yeah. And also the Rotem guided coagulation would also be a good guide. Yeah. Fine. So uh, can we come to the last part of this, which the patient, I think, was doing excellent things. But... Uh, can I open the house to discussion or the panel to what is the ethicality? That means uh, I would be looking at the resource utilization, the futility of such an exercise. So uh, can we just have a few thoughts on the ethicality? That, was it an ethical? Ethically, ethically, they acted for benefit of the patient and their effort was totally non-maleficent. And they must have taken consent, consent from the patient or uh, from the relatives and explain them about chances of re-leading, chances of non-recovery. So they must have been truthful about this uh, patient outcome to the relatives. So I think uh, they have not done anything uh, non-ethical here. Really, and, uh, uh, actually, uh, it's not about, uh, Vijay was not the point, yeah. not about the ethics of the uh, yeah. In the case, in general, if we are faced with such a situation, we know that the mortality rate would be about 50%. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, whether it's an LDLT or a DDLT, the organ hair and the patient hair is very, very precious. So uh, we were just trying to. Uh, yeah, the only thing, about... Dr. Malik, what we can think is whether we could have done the craniotomy and waited for a day or two, seeing the neurological outcome, and then done the LDLT. Because the craniotomy and LDLT was required in this patient. I mean, what we are making out from this patient. But uh, we never know that whether the patient, if without an LDLT, whether he'll become still remain coagulopathic and the craniotomy might not show its good effects of her thing. So considering that the doing both of them together also might be a correct option. So it's very difficult to make out which is the right option, whether a stage craniotomy and then LDLT or it should have been together mm -hmm. or the way they have done it. But finally, the outcomes have been good. So we should just congratulate them. Absolutely. They have done uh, it. <laughs> can I add something? So yeah. um, I think uh, it's quite amazing that uh, uh, what they have done, actually. I know Dr. Vivek and Dr. Piyush and team are brave, but they really pushed the boundaries here. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, thing is, this is not for everybody, I think. Yeah, they, sure. I think this is a well, well, well set system where they're managing this type of patients and uh, coagulopathies, uh, but um, um, but uh, actually it's amazing that uh, this can be done actually. We never thought this could be done. That is something we have to think about. Only other thing I was thinking is in case, like uh, when you're going in and uh, doing the decompression, uh, the other thing is we can actually think about putting a, you know, we are putting a drain. We can actually put a intracranial pressure measurement from the ventricles that might actually give us an idea about uh, managing these patients in the post office. Only other clinical part, if you ask me, that's what I would say. Right. So, any other points the panel would like to add in both the cases? I think for this case, they have whatever they have done is a great job, definitely. And but uh, we will be little scared to apply this to uh, other patients and, uh, and we will hope that we don't get a patient like this yes <laughs> pray that we don't get a patient like this. but they have definitely done a good job it's a fantastic it's i think fantastic. Work and uh, yeah. really good that was so i think uh, i would like to thank suvil and amit and uh, great thanks to piyush and uh, my thanks and gratitude to the panel, Dr. Anandita, Dr. Salva, Dr. Sharmila and Anil, as well as Dr. Vijay. Thank you so much. I think uh, we can conclude this session on this note.
thank you dr ashish for uh, such you. a fantastic case discussion and uh, moderating the session and thank you panelists for uh, opining in a uh, best way and uh, showing a path for the further uh, best management in if we encounter such cases in the future thank you all thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. After the discussion of these two very unique cases, we'll uh, get down to our next session. For this session, we have an elite panel of uh, doctors. We have Dr. Vimy Rewari. Uh, she's a professor, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, AIMS, Delhi. We have Dr. Sumit Goel, uh, Senior Consultant, Anesthesia and Critical Care, CLBS, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. We have Dr. Dr. Mukul Rastogi, Additional Director, Head of Hepatology and Liver Transplant Medicine, Fortis mm -hmm. Hospital, Noida. And we have Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Amrita Institute of Medical Science, Kochi. For the first talk, I would like to invite Dr. Rakhi Maiwali. Uh, she is Additional Professor of Hepatology, Additional Dean, Research, ILBS, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, New Delhi, India. Dr. Rakhi, you can have the stage, please. Uh, Thank you, and thank, I would like to thank Dr. Piyush, LTSI, for uh, inviting me and giving me an opportunity to talk on this topic. And before that, I would first like to congratulate the entire team of photos for managing those. The previous cases were just too exciting for me to hear because we've got so many patients of intracranial hemorrhage. But uh, yes, this was very, very amazing to see their experience of managing such difficult to treat patients. So uh, I will be talking about desensitization in urgent ABO incompatible transplant. Again, it's a challenging area. And even though this uh, symposium is sponsored by Takeda, I have nothing to do with it. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. So I'll talk about initially the need of ABO incompatible transplant. And as the uh, we know that there is an initiative to expand the donor pool and we, need, we have gone down to the extended criteria of donation, donation after cardiac death, machine perfusion has just come along in few years. And we have the living donor program in our country, in, especially in the North. And obviously ABO incompatible is an add-on uh, strategy to expand the donor pool. And if you look at the outcome and the need of ABO incompatible, why we are talking about it, we know that it has come up in the recent era because it has been rapidly being used and uh, because of the shortage of the compatible living donors and with the uh, with the research and with the incorporation of novel desensitization protocols the outcomes of abo incompatible transplant has improved in the coming days and what we see is the statistics wise 10% of japan's and 18% of korean ldlt comprise of ABO incompatible transplant. Now just very briefly about ABO blood group antigens. These are histo blood group antigens, cell surface oligosaccharides, and in the liver, basically they have been demonstrated in the vasculature epithelial cells of the bile duct and the sinuses. And uh, because a liver is supposedly an immune organ, therefore there is a lot of excitement for performing this form of liver transplant for liver patients. So what happens is that there are different mechanisms how the liver goes for an immunomodulation strategy. And this concept of performing an ABO incompatible, we've learned from our nephrology colleagues of how to handle the donor passenger leukocytes, the tolerogenic concept of antigen presenting cells and the immune environment of the liver, which can be targeted. So the basic challenge is to handle the antibody mediated rejection in ABO incompatible liver transplant. And what happens is that whenever there is a exposure of these antibodies in the recipient to the ISO in the hemagglutinins, there is an uh, activation of the complement system. And what happens is this, there is uh, the endothelium of the blood vessels and the bile duct epithelial cells, which express these antigens, there is activation of the complement lytic enzymes are released, there's thrombosis, and what is called as a local low-grade uh, disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation is what is seen in these patients, which is manifested as antibody-mediated rejection. So what do we do and what protocols can be done to handle this form of 
rejection and to desensitize the, donor, the recipients. So various uh, pre-operative desensitization protocols have been developed basically to reduce the IH titers, to attenuate the local inflammation by using local infusion therapy, and by suppressing the B cell activity. And this is the latest development, the rituximab therapy. And subsequently, there are also additional strategies which have been tried, but had been later given up by, but still performed in several centers and the strategy of going with quadruple immunosuppression. So I'll very briefly touch upon each of these strategy of desensitization. Now coming to the apheresis methods, basically, as we understand, we have to remove the antibodies and this can be done by plasma exchange, which can be conventional plasma exchange. It can be cascade plasma pheresis. It can be double filtration or immunoadsorption. So what happens is that in plasma exchange, these IgG or albumin bound protein antibodies, they can be easily removed, which is not possible by the conventional hemodialysis. And with double filtration, cascade filtration plasma pheresis, this is more effective and it does not involve the risk of transfusion transmitted infection. So it is more, but it, it definitely at a higher cost. So immunoadsorption is something which will just selectively absorb these antibodies. So it is much more a uh, safer technique uh, to handle these antibody and for the reduction of antibody titers preoperatively. So what is done is we can check and we can target the antibody titers. Different centers are using different protocols and uh, a, pro, a tighter uh, almost one is to 16 is supposedly conducive to a good transplant. Now, what do the American Society of Apheresis suggest as a recommendation? So for desensitization for ABO incompatible in live donor, there is a recommendation 1C for TPE and to perform a standard volume TPE in these patients for a disease donor, it is a 2C recommendation. Now coming to local infusion therapy, so very quickly, there are a few centers, especially this was proposed initially by Japanese group, where they said that because there is a low grade uh, DIC like state, so apart from giving the pre-transfusion protocol of removing the antibodies, what they suggest is that we can give either methylprednisolone, which is followed in most centers, to be given as an anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. In the anhepatic phase, we can give prostaglandin E1, which improves the microcirculation and prevents this uh, platelet aggregation. And gabixate mesolate has been uh, tried for handling this low-grade DIC. And the initial targeted was to give directly into the portal vein. And subsequently, many centers were using hepatic artery transfusion. However, there was a very high chances of thrombosis. And therefore, this is not followed routinely at most centers. Intravenous immunoglobulin, as we understand, can induce B-cell apoptosis. It can also uh, handle the receptor dependent mechanism of inhibiting the B cells and therefore IVIG can be used as a complementary therapy in handling this form of injury and preventing the antibody mediated rejection in few patients wherein there is a rebound increase in titers despite doing plasma pheresis. So IVIG can be used in such patients as an additional strategy. However, most of the protocols as I will show in different centers do not incorporate IVIG as a routine form of therapy. Splenectomy, because spleen is the major organ which harbors the B cells and the immune cells. So many centers initially started off by doing splenectomy to achieve something like a, uh, the therapy which can help in immunization and can reduce the antibody titers in the post-operative period. However, it was again abandoned and this was a study wherein they showed that splenectomy versus the no splenectomy group did not show any decrease in the incidence of AMR and the incidence of infections and cholangitis and other strictures, cholangitic strictures were all seen equally in both the groups. Therefore, the splenectomy may not be very helpful. Rather, there are several other studies which have shown that splenectomy can even worsen the risk of infections in the post-operative period. Rituximab has been the backbone pillar of uh, therapy in ABO incompatible transplant because rituximab will target selectively the CD20 positive B cells. However, we need to understand that uh, the, in the maturation process of the B cell, CD20 is very, very specific only for a subset of patients. So it is not targeting your plasma cells. It is not targeting the stem cells. So rituximab therapy may still be, uh, need to be combined with other forms of therapy. But there are very, very interesting uh, reports 
of uh, people being treated in Japanese group and this report was by Song et al, where they showed that with the use of rituximab, varying from a dose of 300 to 375, they showed that they could go away by avoiding the cyclophosphamide in the different eras and they showed that the outcomes were not affected and they could go away by not performing even a splenectomy in these patients. But they were going with local infusion therapy in these set of patients. And over the years, they showed that when they abandoned the splenectomy and cyclophosphamide with the use of rituximab, the uh, incidence of antibody-mediated rejection was not higher and the survival of the graft and the patients was equivalent. There are similar other reports from different other Japanese centers. And again, they showed that rituximab prophylaxis could be just one factor, which is an independent predictor of good outcomes and prevention of antibody-mediated rejection in ABO incompatible uh, these liver transplants. And uh, this is another report, again, a retrospective series where they showed that how they abandoned even performing a plasma pheresis in the uh, preoperative era and the local infusion therapy. And they compared the cohort where they just used rituximab and they showed equivalent survival in patients who received everything versus just rituximab. The Koreans are using IVIG. So different protocols are followed in different centers and each center has adopted their own protocol of performing an ABO incompatible liver transplant. The US protocol, we can see here, they're using ATG in the immunosuppressed in the post-op patient's care. Now, very quickly, I will go across uh, transplanting ABO incompatible grafts in emergency situations. And most of the times, if you see the literature, and this is the US data where they showed that most of the times these ABO incompatible transplants were done in patients with high male scores. And they've shown that when they have done transplants for these critically adult patients, that is patients when they were compared in patients who were electively transplanted and had compatible grafts, the survival of the graft and the patients at one year and five year was not different. However, they showed that ABO incompatible grafts definitely had a higher incidence of heart rejection and steroid refractory rejection. Similarly, in acute liver failure, this is a Chinese study where they showed that a combination of rituximab and IVIG in acute liver failure patients was associated with improved outcomes in their cohort. And they used basiliximab as an add-on therapy and IVIG was, was also considered in the post-operative period for almost 10 days. Now, what are the challenges? The challenges remain as we discussed, there is a risk of uh, antibody mediated rejection. And this is a large systematic review and meta-analysis which comprised of 21 studies, none of them a randomized control trial, but uh, the case control and the retrospective and prospective studies which were analyzed and evaluated in this meta-analysis. And we can see here, the antibody mediated rejection was much higher in patients who had ABO incompatible liver transplant. The acute cellular rejection was not different. However, uh, chronic rejection was much more higher in ABO incompatible liver transplant. The incidence of bacterial and fungal infections was rather reduced in, this, in these patients with the use of rituximab and the risk of cytomegalovirus infection was much higher in ABO incompatible transplants as compared to the, uh, the compatible transplants. So rituximab based therapy may be helpful, but we do not know in Indian context because we see definitely a large proportion of patients getting infections in the post-transplant period. Now, very quickly, just touching upon the age of the patients. So if you compare the ABO incompatible transplant with respect to the age, we see that patients who are younger and infants do better as compared to adults because infants have less uh, antibodies and they have less complement mediated damage as compared to adult, adults who are transplanted. And this was shown in this US propensity score math study where they showed that infants had a much more better survival both at one month and three months, which was not different from the incompatible or compatible graphs. However, this was not seen in adults and adults showed a marked reduction in survival because they are more prone to develop antibody mediated rejection. A very interesting retrospective series of 28 patients of dual graft adult transplantation from the Korean group, where they showed that ABO incompatible transplant, even the dual uh, graft was uh, successfully uh, done in their center when compared to the ABO compatible uh, transplants. 
So this is Indian series and this is the Indian South Indian series where they showed that initially they were using two doses of rituximab and two sessions of plasma pheresis. However, because of the high mortality later on, they changed the protocol to one dose of rituximab and plasma pheresis. And they said that a careful selection of protocols has to be done considering the risk of infection. And this is another series from the North India where they showed that they used a protocol of rituximab and targeting the pre-transplant ITER to less than eight. And they still showed that there are dif difficulties in performing these transplants. However, in carefully selected patients and by following these desensitized uh, protocols, we can achieve a successful outcome. This is our protocol at ILBS. So what we do is we give rituximab around 19 to 21 days, two to three weeks prior to the transplant. We have hardly done any emergency liver transplants for uh, ABO incompatible uh, patients. And uh, we use either, and we have now gradually shifted to immunoadsorption from plasma pheresis, and we monitor the titers, and we keep the target titer less than 116 in the post-transplant period and monitor it daily for one week and then alternate day. And uh, we do uh, use triple immunosuppression and basiliximab in few patients, uh, but our results have not been too good. And uh, our mortality has been almost 40% uh, in the set of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raki. This is Dr. Mukul Rastogi, this side, okay. uh, for the excellent crisp presentation. Uh, two questions from my side to you. Uh, number one, what is your protocol of uh, rituximab or plasma pheresis in emergency like ALF situation where the patient is very sick and urgent need of transplant is there? And secondly, what is the safety of rituximab in less than two years of age? Okay. Thank you for both the questions. Uh, the first thing which I would suggest, I just had one paper on this acute liver failure from China and the one from Canada, Canadian experience where they used uh, rituximab based regimen. So the Chinese had combined it with IVIG and the Canadian people had uh, used plasma pheresis. We haven't done any patient with ABO incompatible liver transplant at our center. So I'm not sure because when we receive these patients, most of these patients do have some form of infection, which could be controlled infection. And uh, plasma pheresis we are, we are routinely using for our patients in ALF, uh, but rituximab, I'm not very sure in Indian context, maybe if other people have their experience, they can add on. But this is what the literature suggests. They have, there are only two series on that. The second question was related to the pediatric population, rituximab. So uh, rituximab has been used in the pediatric patients as well, but in the infants which are less than one year and which are uh, young infants or young children, the problem with the, uh, the antibodies and this complement mediated rejection is not much encountered. So rituximab can be given at a lower dose in such patients. It has to be body surface area based uh, dose, which can be given. But again, a very properly selected cohort of patients. That is yeah, regarding the dose of rituximab in sick patient, in uh, infected. It has to patient. be reduced dose. I think so. We cannot give. So standard dose. dose is three seventy five milligram per liter square. Yeah. So what you uh, in our patients we are using two hundred milligram. We have a reduced dose. We have used in some patients of hundred also. In our in our patients, seventeen patients we did at our center. So out of that, in three or four we have used only hundred mg. Per body Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we could take the next, the rest of the questions after the, the next two sessions. Thank you, Rakhi. Your uh, talk always increases our knowledge. Uh, actually, uh, in, when we are talking about the urgent uh, ABI incompatible trans, uh, transplant, so actually we don't have the time to give the retux map for some reason. Maybe they have some preoperative SARS or some infection, so they are not the right candidate for the retux map. So there's a certain situation where we have to move ahead and we uh, go ahead with the plasma pheresis and IVIG and then intraoperative splenectomy and then postoperative IVIG and uh, plasma pheresis. So my question to you is, uh, what is your protocol for plasma pheresis uh, after the transplant where we have not given the rituximab to the patient and uh, what is your protocol for uh, uh, administration of IVIG after the transplant in the same uh, situation? Because another uh, issue with the IVIG is that they are very not notorious for you know uh, creating renal dysfunction. Yes. So can you uh, elaborate? 
so our protocol uh, we have not done as i said that we have not done too many emergency liver transplants but if at all what we target is if you are if the patient is not a candidate for rituximab so we go with plasma exchange and the target titer that we keep is less than 1 is to 16 now recently we've come we've seen very good results with this immuno adsorption there is a glycosops filter that we use which is very selective which is much more safer so you don't encounter the lung problems and infection risk which is associated with the routine plasma pheresis that is something which is a better strategy and ivig again only if there is a rebound increase so after each plasma exchange if you're seeing in many patients they if they there is a rebound increase in the uh, titers then only we go with ivig otherwise uh, as such we do not try to use ivig in this patients yeah thank you dr rakhi hello yeah yes sir am i audible any role of cd19 and cd20 counts uh, to see the efficacy of rituximab Because yeah they, there are many studies which have actually looked at that but that does not help much because it does not uh, correlate with the people have done that but it is very very laborious and it is not practical on performing on day to day basis because at our center max clbs we are doing cd19 and cd20 counts before uh, baseline before giving rituximab and before taking surgery okay sir So we aim for less than one percent count of CD nineteen and CD twenty before taking them for surgery. Okay, sir. Thank yeah, you. there are reports on that. Thank you for letting us know. So, is it helpful, sir? Is it uh, helping you to understand? Yeah, we have postponed many times a case until the CD nineteen or CD twenty falls below one percent. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Doctor Aki. Uh, you have really desensitized this very difficult topic for us. Uh, we'll head on to our next topic for uh, the next. Talk. We have Dr. Ryan Chuda with us. He is an assistant professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine, Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Ryan, we are with us. Hey, good evening, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Can you see my presentation? your your screen is there no okay thank you well good evening so good morning from us but good evening to everyone there um my name is Ryan Chaga as as I mentioned I'm an anesthesiologist in Mayo Clinic Florida I am super excited to join to be invited I wish I could have been there with you in person my parents were very upset that I got invited to a talk in India and I couldn't go so um uh hopefully next year I can join you all in person and be there But uh, today, and I'm very excited to talk about this because I just heard our panel that we um, that we have with us today, and I'm sure they're going to be able to really comment a lot on this. I'm going to give a very peripheral summary of surviving acute on chronic liver failure, some of the current concepts and challenges, um, and hopefully we can generate some good questions after this talk. I uh, have no disclosures. So just in, in real brief, uh, the objectives that we want to of this very quick talk is we want to really just re review the definitions of ACLF um, that we have out there. I want to review some briefly again, review some of the data on survival with ACLF, and I really the meat of this talk is really discuss the considerations of multi-organ dysfunction ACLF, which to the anesthesiologist and the intensivist is really the the, um, the critical thing um, when we're managing these patients in the perioperative or the pre-procedural period. How do we get these patients to transplant? If we transplant them, and how do we manage them um, to ensure that for the most optimal outcome? So, um, one of the big confusions with ACLF is that, um, as you guys, as those of you who know who are well versed in the topic, which I'm sure most of you are, the definition is is very vague. Um, we have kind of from our Asian Pacific Society. And our ESO, our European Society, uh, kind of the two main definitions that we use. We actually have more than these two. There's actually several consensus groups who've come up with their own variations of the definition. But I feel that these in the literature, these are probably the two main ones that are used. Now, when you look at the definition of these two um, societies, the key things I want to emphasize here is you see acute hepatic insult and acute deterioration. That's similar, um, and usually there has to be some obviously some sort of underlying chronic liver disease. And they also emphasize this four-week number, and um, 
And those are kind of the main key similarities. So what I like to say when I look at this is across the board, when looking at all ACLS definitions, they are essentially generally, as I say in quotes, the same. Now, if you dive into it, as you're going to see here, like most of these review articles do, they really do pick apart these definitions. So for example, as you can see here with the uh, Asia Pacific versus the European, the acute insult is hepatic versus extra hepatic, can be extra hepatic in the European. Um, how we factor in variceal bleeding and sepsis as etiologies of the acute insult are different in both definitions. The four week rule when looking at the uh, Asia Pacific is actually um, the, the duration of time in which the, uh, the insult can happen versus in the easel definition, it just means that their mortality is increased after four weeks. So, you know, there's a lot of variation there. This is gonna be one of the issues that we talk about near the end when we summarize that the definitions still aren't clear. But for the most part, I think for all intents and purposes, the way we see these patients clinically, we uh, consider them to be generally falling within these general categories of the QD compensation within four weeks of when they have underlying chronic liver disease. So when we're looking at the acute insult, there's kind of the two, the main ones you want to look at initially from the hepatology standpoint is your acute your, your acute hepatic insults. So that would be your ones that affect the liver directly. So acute alcoholic hepatitis, acute hep B reactivation, um, an autoimmune and Wilson's disease, uh, liver injury. Those are those are the big ones that kind of come up. Again, they're rare, but those are the ones that we kind of classically put in the ACLF. Then we kind of get our more patients that have our chronic injury. So the patients who come in with a severe variceal bleed, the ones who come in with a severe hepatic hydrothoracal infection, the ones who come in with SVP with an infection. And they kind of are the ones that kind of muddy that picture of the extra hepatic considerations. And then you have the group that just comes in decompensated, you know, has chronic alcoholic hepatitis and comes in in renal failure. And we really can't find out why. So, but the key thing is, is kind of differentiating what is the acute insult in the setting of chronic injury and then when they, whether or not it's reversible as you go down to the end there. Now, when you want to define the grades and severity, obviously there's a lot of different uh, grading scores, but this is one of them that kind of, and it goes by organ failure. Let me make sure that this is minimized so everyone can see that. But um, the key thing is that ACLF only um, becomes graded when you have some degree of organ failure. So if you don't have organ failure, you really can't be classified as acute on chronic liver failure. That's kind of one of the key things I wanna emphasize here. So um, as you can see here, uh, in the first category here, it's very specific which patients can, will not fall in the ACLF category. But then as you go down to grade one, grade two, grade three, it has to do with usually single versus multiple versus um, multi-organ system failure. And naturally, as would make sense to most of the anesthesiologists and intensivists in the room, as your multi-organ failure will go up, your mortality will increase. Now, these are looking at mortality in terms of patients who are not transplanted. That's a very important thing to consider. So that's the key thing that I want to emphasize in this, uh, in this, in this data here when you're looking at it. Now, the key thing you also wanna do is when you're looking at that multiple organ failure, you wanna look at the mortality rates based on type of organ. So this is a very nice graph that I like. So obviously, as you can see here, when you don't have ACLF, your mortality is very low, as made sense. And when you have no, uh, no organ failure, that's non-kidney, your, your mortality rate is low. The key thing what happens with uh, ACLF is when you start getting the renal failure, and we're gonna emphasize renal failure when we talk about multi-organ support in a moment. Um, I think that's going to be a very important uh, concept to, to discuss. Uh, but as we get into more and more organ failures, as you, all under, as you all know, the mortality does increase. So as soon as you get that kidney hit here, as you can see, the mortality jumps from under 10% to about 20%. And then as soon as you have multiple organ failures, you start doubling, doubling, and then three organ failures, the mortality is very high without transplantation. And then this is another score that a lot of centers use. I, I, again, there's a lot of different scores, but this is the most common one. This is from our uh, canonic trial as well um, that was done in Europe. Uh, the CLF uh, consortium organ failure score in which they kind of go based on organ systems. So liver, kidney, brain, coagulation, circulation, respiratory, and um, how they classify the severity of their organ failure. And that kind of helps determine prognosis in these patients. So how do we improve survival of these patients? This is kind of the, this is kind of the uh, meat of the presentation in my opinion. I think 
this is the difficult, uh, the difficult thing in these patients because we're having these patients with underlying liver disease, but now they have complete multi-organ failure. So we're going to kind of go organ by organ to just briefly review the things that we should consider when we're looking at these patients. So the first thing to realize is that in all patients with true ACLF, we have what we call this golden window of time. It's usually in the first week of their presentation. And as you can see here, this kind of um, this, this graph looks at all types of liver injury. So acute liver failure, acute on chronic, and just decompensated cirrhosis. And what they always look at in the initial phases of decompensation, you always have about a week in which you can essentially be able to recover the patient or stabilize them. And that's kind of the most important thing that I want to say when it comes to supportive measures. These are not things where you can wait and see what happens. Like with a lot of critically ill patients that are non cirrhotics a lot of times you can say, oh, let's hold off on intubating this patient. Let's hold off on initiating dialysis. Let's hold off on a neurosurgical intervention. You don't have that luxury in acute and chronic liver failure quite often. You have that week, and sometimes even less than a week, sometimes it's two to three days in most patients, I would say clinically from my experience, where you need to pull the trigger and decide to be very aggressive with your multi-organ support and decide if this patient, and then when we move, if this patient's gonna move to transplant. And, um, if you do that, you can. I think that's kind of the key thing in improving outcomes. I think the problem is in a lot of the studies on ACLF, they really do not, you know, look at the time courses of how aggressive people are with their interventions, how aggressively people are transplanted within that first week um, of their presentation when they're probably at their best chances of having um, the best outcome after ACLF. So the first thing with obviously when you're looking at the, the support is obviously treat the precipitant. That goes without saying. Now, the one thing I like to emphasize is 40% of cases don't have a defined precipitant. So that's easier said than done when deciding whether you're going to treat the precipitant. But obviously, for the cases that you know, hepatitis B, you consider your antiviral treatments that you have, acute uh, autoimmune hepatitis, steroids, although some recent literature is showing that maybe steroids may not be the best option in autoimmune hepatitis, maybe just transplantation is a better option. Obviously, infections, antibiotics, and bleeding, you deal with bleeding whatever way it is, whether it's virus seal, you ban them, whether it's um, something within uh, the, uh, the abdominal vasculature, you take them for interventional radiology and embolize, et cetera, et cetera. So treat the precipitant to the best of your ability if you know what it is. But as you can see, in almost half the cases, you don't know what the precipitant is. Aggressive multi-organ supportive care starts, and I kind of work my way from the brain and work my way down. So obviously neurologic, and I think, you know, I've been to a lot of meetings over the past few years, and we kind of focus on this whole idea of ICP management. We focus on, oh, well, what do we do when their ICP is high? Do we do these optic nerve sheath measurements? Do we put an EVD in? And there's always these debates. And I like to take a step back and, and be like, you know, that is just, that is already, you're already far too down the, the, um, the management cycle at that point. You need to return to just aggressive encephalopathy management. And, and I kind of took this, this nice uh, paragraph from one of the review articles. I thought it summarized it. The four prongs for treatment of hepatic encephalopathy are you have to confirm that's there, secure the airway if, it's a, if, it's a, if they're completely altered, and manage the precipitating factors. And most importantly, just empiric hepatic encephalopathy treatment with first-line lactulose. So at our center, I mean, our, our liver ICU team is very aggressive. I mean, they will, they will pour leaders and leaders of lactulose into these patients. And I, I, I have say it somewhat facetiously, but somewhat honestly, because at the end of the day, you know, putting in an EVD measuring ICP, that's important for management of increased ICP, but the underlying cause is kind of trying to reverse that encephalopathy. And that's the key thing. So you have to try to be very aggressive with your lactulose. And as, so, as soon as you sense something is going on, you have to try to be aggressive about treating that upfront. The next organ I want to talk about is the kidneys. I think the kidneys are probably the most critical organ when it comes to ACLF. Obviously, there's a lot of data looking at albumin and presser usage, turlopress and norepinephrine to try to support the kidneys. I will say, as soon as you start to generate AKI in these patients, I am a strong advocate. And I think that this is, again, where the data is not very good in ACLF on looking at renal replacement therapy. I think renal replacement therapy has to be considered very early, or at least considerations, even before they stop making urine, to start balancing out those electrolyte abnormalities, to start creating, to try to, to, try to replace that organ failure that's happening. Because remember, as soon as you put that organ failure in the ACLF scores, their mortality goes up. But if you can replace that with early renal replacement therapy, you can essentially reverse some of the processes that are occurring and some of the complications that occur with renal uh, complications. When it comes to respiratory, the big question is, do I intubate, do I not, when they have some sort of pulmonary pathology? And it's very difficult to know what the right answer is, because obviously if they're hypoxemic, you have to protect their airway, you have to ventilate them effectively. But I will say this, I think the most important thing is, yes, you may intubate them, but aggressively 
extubate them or, or perform a tracheostomy to, uh, to uh, wean them from mechanical ventilation as soon as possible. Again, you know, because when they're on mechanical ventilation, while in that, for that 24 to 48 hour period, it may be critical, you know, as they move out farther and farther past that golden period, as I mentioned, the mechanical ventilation is going to do more harm than good. And finally, cardiovascular is a really interesting area because most of these patients, as you know, they have a superimposed vasodilatory state uh, on top of their underlying cirrhotic physiology. So we're dealing with a lot of uh, situations there. And now, uh, as similar to the US, I know NASH uh, volumes are going up worldwide. So we're having a lot of patients who have concomitant cardiac disease. Every day on our different uh, listservs, we get emails of patients who have you know, very high risk coronary artery disease, some sort of high risk valvular disease, severe pulmonary hypertension, and it's going up and up. So how do we deal now? This is a new element with the ACLF because we have these patients now who have a superimposed vasodilatory state and now have some sort of cardiac lesion that may be contributing to their decompensation as well that needs to be managed. And finally, the last thing that we always forget, we focus just on these organs. We forget about the idea of frailty and early PT continuing the nutrition and, and getting palliative care involved. You know, I think a fundamental failure is that we immediately don't feed these patients quite often. I know in my center, we immediately, even if they're in the most sick state, one of the priorities in addition to putting in a central line, putting in dialysis line, starting CRT is putting in a feeding tube and starting uh, drip feeds as soon as possible. Ensure that gut is still getting some degree of nutrition. Obviously, PT is very difficult in a lot of these patients, but like I said, if you can liberate them from the vent, you can get them moving, get them at least sitting in a chair versus supine in bed and, and, and non-ambulatory. And palliative care is very important. The reason why I, I bring up palliative care is not palliative care from a, oh, end of life thing, but palliative care to, to emphasize what, how much multi-specialty care needs to go into these patients and to ensure that all the service lines and the severity of disease is understood by the families, but to know that they can turn around but at the same time, poor outcomes can occur. So when it comes to referral for transplant, I think this is kind of the key thing that I think we always ask the question. And the one thing I will say, if you look at all the data here, the survival in transplant versus not transplant is significantly improved. So obviously it could show, and when you look at the notes here, some of them favor transplant, some of them don't, but I would say that transplant, these patients will survive. I think in general, that's the key understanding you want, to, you want to do. But the question is, when do you refer them to transplant and at what time do you transplant them? Do you transplant them when they're at multi-organ failure or do you transplant them when they are um, at their best or try to optimize them as much as possible? And obviously, when you're looking at other options, um, I think liver support systems are another exciting opportunity that people really haven't utilized. There's really two main um, randomized control trials that have showed good multi-organ function and good safety in these patients. But however, due to the small numbers of patients, um, there really were no difference in survival. But I will say this, in all of those patients, they improved their multi-organ function. So the patients who had reductions in MELD had improved survival after transplant if they were transplanted. But the one caveat is that they're very costly and resource intensive. You know, at our center, when we do MARS at our center, it, has, it requires two nurses dedicated to one patient and multiple, multiple resources from a, from a cost standpoint. And then other things that they've been described for ACLF, which are really early in the phases are stem cell therapy and things like that. So in summary, I know my time's up, I apologize, I'm taking a few minutes over. Um, the current concepts that we can agree upon is that there's a generally agreed upon definition. The most important thing is you have to establish the severity early on. Um, you have to treat the precipitant and multi-organ support must be early and aggressive. And Regardless, early transplant evaluation, you have to rule, rule them in as a candidate so that you can aggressively transplant them if necessary. This is a nice algorithm that a lot of you have seen that they kind of tell you how to kind of uh, take these patients along. I'm not going to summarize this, but this kind of is what is established in ACLF. But then what are the challenges? I think, again, we still don't have a good consensus on definition. So I think we miss out on patients who are truly ACLF um, versus just a decompensation of their chronic liver disease. I still think that we can improve our multidisciplinary care. I think we're doing a phenomenal job having meetings like this between ICU, anesthesia, surgery, and hepatology to better ma manage these patients. I think the more and more we move into the future, this is gonna be critical to improve outcomes in these patients. I don't think we're utilizing these support devices well. I still think these are very, very helpful um, if utilized appropriately in these patients, especially if we're bridging them to transplant, it's very critical. And when to transplant them, I think we have to transplant them early. I think. 
the trigger has to be pulled early, even in situations of where they have multi-organ dysfunction. This is, this is my personal opinion. You have to try to put the organ in because that's the only thing that's going to reverse them. If you try to wait till they're optimized, I think quite often you lose your window of when they'll be able to be transplanted. Um, thank you so much. And uh, take any questions and here are my references. Excellent presentation, Dr. Ryan. Uh, you said when to transplant. So I just want to know whether this uh, meld allocation system is applicable for ACLF or not, or it depends upon the grade of the liver uh, ACLF, whether it is grade two, grade three, grade four, which is more important in this scenario. You know, I think this is kind of the flaw with the MELD system, right? It, quite often, it, it misses out on some of these patients with multi-organ dysfunction. I think you're totally right. I think I think you need to move towards transplant when you get to those higher grades. Now, the big the big concern with these higher grades, and this is a discussion that happens at every meeting, is that well, which when, when is it futile? You know, when is it futile? And and, and that's and I, I think it's very hard to generalize in the situation because it goes case by case. For example. You know, a 75-year-old with severe aortic stenosis, no one's going to transplant that, right? But a, a 45-year-old alcohol, acute alcoholic hepatitis on maximal vent support, maximal pressure support, you know, with no cardiac comorbidities, with a good support system, you may, that they're both grade threes, right? But the grade three, one, you're going to transplant versus the other. Unfortunately, we're kind of tied up with the meld as our utilization. Now, luckily, most of these patients usually have pretty high melts when they're in decompensated uh, uh, ACLF. But I will say, I think you're right. I, it, would be, it would make more sense for these patients, especially in our system where I, where I work, where we do deceased donor for them to get a higher priority. Can I ask one question, Dr. Ryan? Hi, thank you for that excellent talk. I, I'm also one of the proponents for consideration of early dialysis or early CRRT in patients. And uh, I would like to know what is early for you? How would you consider which criteria? What is your uh, experience of lactate clearance on CRRT in patients with acute and chronic liver failure? The third point is what about the challenges with coagulation? And uh, we encounter a lot of bleeding and DIC being uh, the activation of uh, coagulation, thrombocytopenia, bleeding complications in patients who are started initiated on CRRT. And therefore, we combine plasma exchange in most of these patients. And that has we have seen that that uh, gives us better outcomes. So I would like to know your uh, experience on that. So uh, the three questions, and I apologize, I forget to CRRT, I think, I think it's never early enough. I think as soon as they present with the initial insult, and this is what I've learned from my years of working, I work with a very aggressive group in our liver ICU, that as soon as one of these patients comes in, say they come in with a baroceal bleed, or they come in you know, with severe hepatic encephalopathy, it's a standardized protocol that they have. They get central venous axis, dialysis axis, CRRT started. It doesn't matter what their creatinine is. It doesn't matter what it is. We start it immediately. And so I think as soon as you suspect ACLF and acute decompensation, Regardless of what the cause is, we're, we'll have to work out what the cause is at the same time. They start the CRRT early. Our nephrologists do not like it because we're being very, you know, they think it's not, they think, well, because they always wait, you know, no indication for dialysis. I think we basically take that organ failure and we basically take it out of the picture. So I think it's very important. And I think I've seen, again, anecdotally, I'm going to say anecdotally, I've seen the lactate get better because you're supporting the organ. You know what I'm saying? Now, I don't think the CRRT itself directly removes the lactate. But I will say that I think that it's because you're supporting the organs support and reversing the cause and doing everything very aggressively in the first 24 to 48 hours, the lactate clearance improves. That's that, that's the kind of the, my, my uh, comment there. The third comment I will make is about bleeding complications. So um, it's tough. It's tough. We use at our center, we use TEG because that's what we have. I Obviously, we can have years and years of conversation on whether TEG is better, whether Rotom better, whether they even matter at all. I will say this, I think we look at, um, our team is very, uh, is very aggressive about, you know, just, just trying to, you know, control the bleeding where it happens, you know? So if they have some sort of bleeding diathesis, even in the stomach, they, they'll leave drains. We drain every, we put percutaneous drains as much as possible because with the goal, but I will say this, the thing is the goal at that point is getting them to transplant. You know, we are not, we are not trying to hold them off from transplant at that point. So we try within the first one to two weeks to get them transplanted. So, but it's difficult with bleeding, right? 
Uh, we haven't, I don't know that we've used plasma exchange. I will say that I don't have any experience with that, but it makes sense from your perspective. So that's my, that's my, my thought um, when it comes to that. Hopefully that answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for your very informative talk. I have one question for you. When would you deny liver transplant in case of ACLF grade three? So um, usually I'll tell you based on my experience, based on my experience, the, the cases that I've seen are usually if they have some sort of cardiac comorbidity, that's usually been the biggest one. If they have, you know, we had a recent case of a patient who had a severe LAD lesion and it was, oh my God, we had so many discussions about this patient. Should we stent them? Should we not? And I will say, once you're having that discussion, you kind of, the time that it takes to have that discussion, you lose the ability to transplant these patients. So I'd say the biggest reason is usually cardiac comorbidity. The second one is age. I think age is the biggest one. We've had a couple of patients who are like in a 70, you know, or, and the third thing is a lot of times these patients, they come in and they just don't have the support systems. You know, and it's non, it's non medical reasons. It's just, you know, we try, things are moving so fast. We try to get them urgently listed, but then they don't have the support post transplant that even if we know they could probably survive, they're not going to do well. So we have to refer them for palliation and go from there. But I would say that's rare. I would say the first two are probably the most, most common. I would say age and a severe cardiac lesion. But I will say cardiac is becoming less and less a reason. We're doing all sorts of weird stuff now with tavers and, putting high risk stents in. We, we put an impella in a patient recently. I, I'm not saying this is the way we should do it, but I think, you know, like you're, I've heard that case you talked about with the craniotomy previously, we're pushing the envelope. So really it's hard to say that you should, there's any distinct criteria to deny a patient in stage three ACLF. Any role of Cliff C ACLF score in deciding the transplant for ACLF grade three? Yes. Yes. We, we, we utilize, is that what you're asking? Do we use that or? Okay. Yeah, that's that's what we use normally. So, thank you, thank you, Doctor. No that's problem. Hi, I am. We've had. So I think uh, we could move on to the next speaker. Ashish, do you have a question? No. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rayan. Hey, Ashish. How are you? Great Good. talk. Actually, that was just the continuation of what Sumit asked. Was do you have a role towards Cliff? See moving on from Meld. So that, that's what I wanted to ask. That's it. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Hopefully we'll be able to. I think there's still a lot more discussions that have to happen, but hopefully soon. So. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to our next topic. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Selva Kumar Maleshwaran as a speaker. He's the head of uh, anesthesia and critical care at Glenn Eggers Global Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Selva, you can have the floor. Hi. Uh, thanks, Vishu uh, and the organizers, for uh, um, allowing me to have this talk. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yeah. So, um, this is, uh, yeah, sure. So, this is basically a physiology based uh, talk, and I will try to make it as uh, clinically relevant as possible um, in the mandatory disclaimer. So, I want to break this uh, uh, talk into four aspects. One is that um, the physiology of uh, splanchnic circulation and uh, what happens to splanchnic and uh, systemic circulation in cirrhosis and um, what is the actual crosstalk we are talking about and what are the like, clinical applications and how do we actually intervene? How do we apply the knowledge uh, for clinical benefit? So this is quite uh, uh, basic, um, you know, uh, just to give an intro about uh, splanchnic circulation, it, it handles about 25% of the cardiac output comes through three major arteries, celiac, uh, superior, and inferior mesenteric arteries. And the liver gets 25% of the blood from the hepatic artery, 75% through the, um, uh, the, the other two arteries and into the portal line. All the blood ultimately goes into the hepatic veins into the IVC. So the, the flow, portal flow uh, is relevant here, which we will uh, discuss and the intrahepatic vascular resistance usually distal to the uh, level of sinusoids. So, uh, the, the splanchnic circulation, the special thing about splanchnic circulation is splanchnic reservoir. We are uh, discussing about reservoir because uh, this is something which is usually lost in the cirrhosis and, the, and, and actually on the contrary, we are actually having splanchnic steel. So this is something we just uh, need to have a rough idea about, about um, the, out of the blood which is uh, there in the splanchnic circulation about 1200 almost two thirds can be immediately auto transfers to the systemic circulation in a physiological, in a physiological stress something like bleeding, which will almost be equivalent to two units of whole blood. 
So this happens by catecholamine uh, stimulation, sympathotinal outputs, and um, which causes the arterial vasoconstriction, which eliminates the splanglish circulation out of the circulation, out of the oral circulation. And uh, once the arteries get uh, constricted, the, the veins also go into a passive recoil and then uh, push the blood into the systemic circulation leading to our autotransfusion. So what happens in cirrhosis um, uh, in splanglish circulation? So the the uh, the um, the cirrhosis is not only a it's, it's not only a disease of the liver but it's more of a disease of the splanglish circulation. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, breakdown is like we have uh, intrahepatic vasculature issues. I'm not going to go into the details. So you have a combination of mechanical and uh, vasoactive problems inside the liver, and uh, all of this leads to increased intrahepatic resistance. So this increased intrahepatic resistance here uh, leads to portal hypertension. So the most important operative word here is portal hypertension, and uh, uh, it's not the, the it's not the um, uh, shunts, it's not the bacterial translocations, mainly the portal hypertension. So the portal hypertension leads to uh, shear stress in the portal circulation, in the splanglish circulation, and uh, produces a sort of maladaptive splanglish vasodilatation. This is the main uh, driving force for uh, for uh, for the, the uh, uh, problems which we usually face in uh, cirrhosis. So this uh, increased splanglish uh, uh, circulation uh, uh, volume increases the capacitance. It, it, it holds almost 37% of the total blood volume. So this leads to a significant steal from the central circulation. And this uh, steal is what uh, initiates your uh, neurohemoral respiratory reflexes, the sympathetic nervous system, renin angiotensin system, and the vasopressin system, all of which lead to a hypodermic circulation. So if you go back to this thing, uh, the, the slide, so in, initially you have a liver injury, you have a portal hypertension, and the portal hypertension leads to uh, the splanchnic vasodilatation, which leads to the splanchnic uh, steel, and then leads to central hypovolemia. So the central hypovolemia leads to hypodermic circulation. This is the basic um, uh, pathophysiology which happens, and then which also leads to other vascular syndromes in the respective organs. So uh, the question here is, um, uh, how do we uh, um, uh, how do we use this uh, knowledge? So before we go into that, there is a, another discussion which uh, which keeps coming up actually about the the metabolites and the toxins which get uh, shunted out into the systemic circulation, causing an increase in the you know uh, the overall hypodermic circulation. So it also contributes, but I think the main uh, the, the the literature is showing that main uh, component of of this uh, um, hypodermic circulation is the portal hypertension. So there is this inter interesting commentary, which is, uh, which is about uh, which is the chicken and which is the egg, basically, um, uh, which leads to what? Um, looking at all the review and of literature, is, uh, it looks like portal hypertension is the deciding factor, which leads to uh, the hypodermic circulation. So how do we use this uh, knowledge uh, to our benefit? So there are um, things which we which we need to do in our um, uh, peritransplant uh, uh, managements. I'm not going to go into the uh, serotic management of uh, HRS or or, uh, or uh, bleeding varices patients. So first thing is the portal flow modulations, which helps us in two ways. Uh, one is again to reduce the bleeding. And number two is to, uh, to optimize the graft functions once the reperfusion happens. And the second component is the management of central blood volume, which maintains the perfusion for all the organs. So we have two uh, goals here, and we have possibly two interventions here. One is the vasoactive drugs, uh, like your catecholamines or vasopressin. The other intervention is a fluid. So how do we use the vasoactive drugs and fluids uh, using this uh, uh, interlinking between the splanchnic and central circulation? So coming to the intra LT management, we have the dissection phase and there is a progressive fall in SVR, which usually happens. And we end up, uh, uh, we end up having to support the uh, uh, perfusion, uh, the hemodynamics. So the options would be either a, you know, a vasopressors or a fluid loading, but uh, fluid loading, we generally have, I think everyone has started coming down, but uh, the physiology is here is, um, there is increased venous compliance and capacitance in the splanchnic circulation in cirrhotic patients. So for the same amount of fluid uh, in a normal patient and in a cirrhotic patient, we know that most of it goes to the splanchnic circulation. So giving fluid is not a viable option to just maintain hemodynamic instability. So, so there are two options to optimize the volume and blood management during the dissection phase. One is to completely restrict the volume 
and then give it after reperfusion. And the other is to give a splanchnic vasoconstrictor to recruit the splanchnic volume. So the restriction of volume rest strategy is like, uh, it's quite simple. Um, uh, we just reduce the CVP to less than five or sometimes less than 40% of the baseline. This will reduce the overall systemic volume and also the splanchnic volume and reduce the uh, bleeding uh, requirements, the bleeding and the transmission requirements. So the components would be either overall fluid restriction, uh, no routine coagulation correction, diuretics, reverse tendon repositions. So out of which I think fluid restriction is widely followed nowadays. Uh, people are following restrictive regimens and no routine coagulation is also widely followed. Diuretics and reverse tendon are or the other end of the spectrum, which may or may not be uh, clinically applicable. So the problem with only using this strategy, this is actually a good strategy, which we should probably all use uh, to, to reduce the overall uh, uh, volume and to also reduce the splanchnic volume and in turn reduce the bleeding. But the only thing is if you, if you use only this strategy as our option, we end up uh, having a chance of having a reduced perfusion and increased instance of uh, AKS. So that coming to that, you have the other option of recruiting the splanchnic blood we have a significant amount of blood which is which is uh, which is uh, you know sequestrated into the splanchnic circulation and we have the drugs to push it out so this is a physiology you, the, the, uh, not going to go into the details of this basically the arterial circulation has both alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 2 uh, receptors and uh, most of the capacitance vessels have predominantly alpha 1 alpha 2 uh, uh, receptors so what about using catecholamines to push the blood from the uh, splanchnic circulation into the systemic circulation? Um, uh, if we try to use uh, something like a pure alpha agonist like phenylephrine or sometimes even noradrenaline, the problem here is as we saw, uh, the, the alpha receptors are there in both pre and post uh, um, uh, cap, uh, portal uh, systems and it may not actually effectively push the uh, blood into the system, into the central volume. And epinephrine has been so shown to reduce the spleen volume and to push the blood into the central volume. But the factor here is uh, this is uh, these this physiological things are applicable for a normal liver. When you have a fixed intrahepatic vascular resistance, as happens in advanced cirrhosis, this may not matter. The, the other factors which come into play are the amount of shunts and the amount of volume of blood in the slanging circulation. So the, the clinically relevant uh, the studied options are again the vasopressin analogs, you know, AVP, arginine vasopressin, and the uh, lysine vasopressin, which is terlipressin. Uh, vasopressin has been studied to, to try and use to reduce the portal venous pressure, which is which I think it did. But if you look at it, it even the, the 2.4 units per hour, which is what we usually go up to, uh, didn't actually increase the central blood volume. It reduced the portal venous pressure, but it increased, didn't increase the central blood volume. So terlipressin has a bit more of V1 receptor sensitivity compared to uh, uh, vasopressin. Terlipressin has a ratio of about 2.2 is to 1 compared to 1 is to 1 for vasopressin. So terlipressin has effective in uh, shifting the blood volume away from the splanchnic circulation into the systemic circulation. So this helps to achieve two things. One is it reduces the portal blood flow and uh, reduces our bleeding. And the second thing is by increasing the intravascular intra volume, central volume, it improves the blood pressure and the perfusion. So coming to the reperfusion phase, here I think uh, the, the, the idea is to maintain the adequate graft perfusion and prevent hyperperfusion injury. And so the operational word here is portal venous pressure, uh, which, which determines the portal venous flow. Uh, the, the, the traditional worry of having a high PEEP or high CVP in case if it is there. Um, the studies actually, there are a lot of studies which have said that it don't really, uh, they don't really matter uh, many times because as long as the quality of the graft is okay, uh, increase in the CVP because of PEEP uh, or the direct increase in CVP did not reduce the portal venous flow, probably because the graft is uh, compliant enough to take up the volume. So if you look at the other major factor where your um, the cross track can help us is uh, in a LDLT setting where you have a small fossa syndrome. So portal flows are, uh, are a good portal flow is obviously needed for a graft regeneration, but too high levels can cause uh, shear stress and cytokine release, which is the pathophysiology behind the small fossa syndrome. And the other thing which happens in a small fossa syndrome is portal hyperperfusion leads to a reflex uh, 
uh, vasoconstriction of the artery and a fall in the hepatic artery uh, resistance index. So by reducing the portal flow, uh, terlipresin prevents this uh, pathophysiology and sort of reduces the impact because of small vessel syndrome. So if you look at this, uh, the V1 receptors are there in both artery and the veins, but um, comparatively the V1A receptors through which terlipresin act is more in the capacitance side, meaning portal venous side compared to artery side. So at the end, the net result is you have better arterial flow and a reduction in the portal flow and a reduction in the small for size uh, impact in the, uh, in the new liver. So again, this is something which is uh, uh, showing the same thing, which is uh, there is a significant decrease in the hepatic artery uh, resistive index with the usage of uh, telepresin. So uh, the other factor which we are worried about when you are managing a, a LDLT patient or, or any liver transplant patient is the perioperative renal functions, which again depends upon two factors, two major factors other than the uh, bleeding and the other things, uh, the pre-transplant HRS. Uh, pre-transplant HRS could be optimized by replacing the central volume by treating the uh, uh, treating with spinal uh, constrictors. So the studies have shown that when you have a successfully treated pre-LT HRS patients, they had the outcomes which are almost equivalent to non-HRS patients. During LT, again, it comes to the same uh, discussion of replacing the volume uh, into the central circulation, maintaining the renal perfusion, so we can avoid renal hypoperfusion during LT. So this was a study which we did in uh, 2016 to 17. It was a double printed study in our center uh, where we gave 1MG of uh, telepresin initially and then ran two mics per kg per hour for almost 72 hours. Uh, there, was no, uh, there was no significant difference in the overall graft outcomes or small first size, but there was a significantly less AKI and drain output in the telepresin group, which uh, was uh, partially explained by the improvement in the central volume and, uh, and, the, and the reduction in the splanic sequestration. So the other thing which also happened in our study, which we noticed was that uh, many of these patients um, had bradycardia and some of these patients also had a little bit of uh, increase in lactate in the post-operative phase. So, so this is the other uh, last thing which we want to discuss. So this hyperdynamic circulation in the uh, cirrhosis in transplant patients usually reverses in the post-transplant situation. So they behave in a different way to volume and to splanic vasoconstrictors in the post-operative phase. The dosage which we usually give in the pre-transplants of uh, telepresin may not be uh, may not be actually safer in the post-transplant uh, patients where uh, they are very sensitive uh, because already there is a there is a reversal of the flow which is uh, splanic vasoplegia which is happening and the blood is uh, coming back into the main central circulation and that time if you give a significant vasoconstrictor or a splanic vasoconstrictor or a significant volume, you may end up with the pulmonary congestion and edema. So this is the overall um, um, uh, overview of the uh, of the of the of the physiology here. So basically, um, uh, the factors here are splanic circulation handles about twenty five percent of the cardiac output, and when you have cirrhosis, portal hypertension leads to central hypovolemia and then leads to hyperdynamic circulation. So this is the link actually, if you look at it, uh, the splanchnic, uh, the crosstalk is actually the, the link between splanchnic and uh, uh, systemic circulation is the, that the blood gets stolen into the system as splanchnic circulation, there is a big splanchnic steel. So this pushing the splanchnic uh, circulation and uh, managing the splanchnic circulation has profound impact on the systemic circulations. So for that, we can use uh, mass active agents and fluids to our advantage. So in the intraoperative management, we have um, uh, the, our goals would be mostly about maintaining the central blood volume, avoiding bleeding, and uh, improving the graft and renal functions. For this, we can use uh, um, uh, splanchnic vasoconstrictors carefully, and um, we also need to think about volume coming back into the system uh, from the splanchnic pooling uh, in the postoperative phase when you are managing the uh, postoperative fluid uh, in these patients. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Selva. One question in my mind yeah. that uh, use of vasoconstrictor, turly pressin or uh, vasopressin during uh, transplant surgery perioperatively. So, what is your take on that? So, uh, exactly. So, um, the concerns uh, uh, here are again, as we were discussing, to to get the blood uh, uh, from the splanchnic circulation into the systemic circulation. This is not a very straightforward, uh, you know, just like uh, pushing the uh, blood into the system.
system because there are a lot of complex interactions there, depends upon intrahepatic vascular resistance, depends upon the shunt. But ultimately, to some extent, telepresence helps in taking the blood out of sinus circulation into the systemic circulation. So we achieve two things here. One is it doesn't cause congestion of the liver, reduces the bleeding, and it also improves the systemic hemodynamics without the need for giving a lot of fluids. So that is a main factor we are dealing with here. We end up giving a liters and liters of fluid, and that is going to cause post-operative problems. Here, we are main, able to maintain perfusion without actually giving a lot of fluids by taking the fluids which is already inside the system. The problem which can happen theoretically is that you can reduce the portal flow too much. So that is another thing which we need to think about. Usually, whenever we were running this, uh, especially for this study, we were uh, we were mon we were monitoring the portal flows uh, by Dopplers and um, um, some keeping it somewhere around 40 to 60 centimeters. Not a perfect uh, 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 marker, but we had some monitoring there. It does not decrease the hepatic arterial flow uh, in the dosages which we are used. Only when we give high doses, it can reduce the hepatic arterial flow. And the other factor is if you have ischemic heart disease, this can cause quite a bit of stress because it is going to increase both your preload and afterload. So that is something we need to keep in mind. This is not an all-out uh, solution for everybody, but for sick patients where you want to reduce the volume, you can try and use this and then uh, you know use the physiology to our advantage. Uh, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. So, actually, hello, this I, is uh, Dr. Dave. Is somebody asking question, please? Yes, this is Dr. Dave. Yes, yes, sir. Please continue. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Selva Kumar. Uh, and very nice talk. And I was also of the impression of terlipressin or vasopressin in the use of uh, either hepatorenal syndrome or getting some splacking blood into the systemic side. However, uh, there is a very recent study published, I think, this week only, and which, again, stresses that nothing is very simple and it's all so complicated. They studied terlipressin and albumin for uh, hepatorenal syndrome, not for the transplant setting, but for hepatorenal syndrome. And, of course, hepatorenal syndrome improved in ter terlipressin group, but the 90-day mortality was significantly five times higher compared to the placebo group. And most of the deaths were because of the respiratory problems. There was 11% uh, uh, mortality in a early pressing group compared to 2% in the placebo group after hepatorenal syndrome treatment. So do you have any kind of thoughts or comments yes. on that? I mean, things are not very straightforward. That is what I want to say. Yes, definitely, definitely. So uh, um, uh, that is very important. This is not just a, just a simple one single flow which is getting diverted this way or that way. There are a lot of factors into play. There are a lot of uh, uh, levels at which it can uh, impact. But uh, basically this is what uh, we have seen this happen in the pre-transplant patients, cirrhotic patients, uh, which they, whom they whom behave uh, very very um, uh, badly to terlipressin. Uh, as I was discussing, when you are giving terlipressin as an infusion, it is very very important that you have a watch over the central volume. Say it can be a, a rough estimation of uh, IVC diameter, or if you have a CVP, at least a trend in the CVP. If you have other cardiac output monitors, that would be also good. Not all patients might need this, but you need to know where the patient is in terms of volume because it's going to significantly push a lot of volume into the system uh, directly or indirectly, and that might trip the uh, congestion into pulmonary edema. And uh, once a cirrhotic patient develops a pulmonary edema, the lymphatic drainage is already very poor, and we will have a prolonged uh, respiratory failure and uh, problems. So this is something which we have seen, and uh, the important factor is to monitor the central volume. Yeah, and more importantly, it was a three-month post treatment when the mortality was high. So it is a little bit of long-term effects as well. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Selva. And yes. thank you for, thank you to all the chairpersons for a wonderful discussion. Let us move on to the next session. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for the you. next session, uh, our elite panel of chairmen have Chairpersons have Dr. Samir Sethi, Additional Professor, Anesthesia and Critical Care, PGI Chandigarh, Dr. Vaishali Salo, Senior Consultant, Interventionist, Jupiter Hospital, Pune, Dr. Sangeeta Shetty, Senior Consultant, Anesthesia and Critical Care, Fortis Hospital, Mumbai, 
and Dr. Vaibhav Nasa, Senior Consultant, Anesthesia and Critical Care, CLBS, Max Super Speciality Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. As a first speaker, we have Dr. Kunal Karamchandani. He's a Donald E. Martin Career Development Professor in Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, Division Chief, Anesthesia Critical Care Medicine at Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine. Kunal, you can have your stage. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, the birthplace of uh, Hershey chocolates and the sweetest place on earth. So uh, again, thank you so much to, uh, for the opportunity today. And as part of the session, I would be talking about the challenges that we face as far as uh, escalation of antifungal therapy after liver transplantation. Now I have no disclosures and no conflicts of interest. Now, during my presentation, I would be talking about invasive fungal infections after liver transplantation. We'll briefly go over the epidemiology. We'll talk about the causes, risk factors, and trends. And I know there's a dedicated session to invasive fungal infections right after hours, so I'll try to keep this a little brief. And then we'll move on to talk about antifungal therapy after liver transplantation. We'll talk about the utility. We'll talk about universal versus targeted prophylaxis, the various agents that we have, if anyone is better than the other, the duration of therapy. And then uh, we'll conclude by talking about what do the international guidelines recommend as far as antifungal therapy after liver transplantation. Now, we all know that invasive fungal infections are pretty common in uh, liver transplant recipients. If you look at the epidemiology, let's talk about the incidence. So historically, the incidence of uh, invasive fungal infections has been estimated to be about 5 to 20% in all solid organ transplant recipients and about 5 to 42% in liver transplant recipients. Now, if you look at the more recent numbers, I'm going to talk about a few studies that have been done recently looking at the incidence. This one was published last year. It's from Ontario, Canada, where they did a population-based cohort study of solid organ transplant recipients over the years 2012 to 2016. And they identified about 9,000 such recipients and the incidence was about 5% in all comers. And when they looked at the liver transplant recipients, they found that the incidence was about 3.4%. Give me one second. All right, now uh, this is a study which came out of Australia, a single center retrospective cohort study it looked at liver transplant recipients from 2005 to 15 and the incidence that they found was about 5%. Now this is from Korea, a multi-center study looking at again, the incidence of invasive fungal infections in liver transplant recipients, 2009 to 2012, and the incidence was about close to 5% again. Now, what is the impact of these fungal infections? Now, they impact both morbidity and mortality. If you look at mortality, the incidence is as high as about 70%. And we all know that that's much higher with invasive aspergillosis versus candidal infections. Now, this also leads to an increased hospital length of stay. And it has been estimated that patients who develop invasive fungal infections after liver transplantation spend an additional 23 days in the hospital because of that. Now, of course, this leads to a significantly Excuse high me, economic not, burden. Slides are not visible, I think. Let me see, sorry. Is it visible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank I'm you. sorry. These software glitches with virtual meeting, I'm sorry. All right, so let me go back a slide or two. Uh, all right, let's start with the impact. So, you know, we know that invasive fungal infections have a significant impact on morbidity and mortality. And if you look at absolute numbers, uh, the mortality has been as high as about 70%. And as I said, it's more with invasive aspergillosis. Again, the hospital length of stay increases, additional 23 hospital days are estimated to be spent uh, with patients who develop invasive fungal infections. Now, of course, this all leads to a significantly high economic burden, and it has been estimated that patients who develop these infections have about $62,000 in additional costs. Now, let's talk about the various causes of invasive fungal infection. Now, this is a study that was done from the Prospective Antifungal Therapy or PATH Alliance Registry, which includes about 17 United States hospitals, and they looked at their proven and probable invasive fungal infections. What they found was that the predominant cause was candidal infection followed by aspergillosis. 
Let's move on and discuss some of the risk factors that are associated with invasive fungal infections. Now we'll talk about some recent studies which have evaluated these risk factors. Again, this is a study that I talked about previously as well, the single center study from Australia. Now they also looked at risk factors in addition to the incidence. And what they did was kind of a case control model where they matched each case with the fungal infection with two controls. And they looked at from the years from 2005 to 15 and found that reoperation, ruin viability and astomosis, massive intraoperative transfusion more than 40 units were associated with a higher risk of invasive fungal infection. Now, the same study that I talked about from Korea, they also looked at the risk factors and what they found was that history of use of antifungal agents, retransplantation, fungal colonization, and use of parental nutrition was associated with a higher risk of invasive fungal infections. Now, if you look at the overall risk factors for uh, invasive candidiasis and invasive aspergillosis, the two most common invasive fungal infections, here's a list. Now, in liver transplant recipients, the ones that stand out are anastomotic leaks, reoperation, and cholelocogigenostomy. When we talk about invasive aspergillosis, the two that I want to talk about are CMV infection and renal requ failure requiring renal replacement therapy. And the reason is that they are also associated with a higher risk of mortality in patients who develop invasive aspergillosis. Now let's talk about some trends. As we talked about earlier as well, historically the incidence was pretty high and it has come down significantly. Same with mortality as well. If you compare the mortality, for example, for invasive aspergillosis, we know that the mortality was almost as high as 100% and it has come down significantly. With candidiasis, it's almost half. Now this is perhaps due to the use of novel antifungal agents, a more uh, you know, comprehensive use of antifungal prophylaxis, improvement in surgical techniques, and improvement in general for the perioperative care. But challenges still remain. You know, we're transplanting livers in sicker patients. The transplantation criteria, the donor criteria have been liberalized. And there's always this threat of development of resistant organisms as we talk about prophylaxis. So let's switch gears and talk about antifungal therapy after liver transplantation. Now, antifungal prophylaxis has become a cornerstone after liver transplantation. It has led to significant improvement in incidence as well as outcomes associated with invasive fungal infections. And it is strongly recommended by international guidelines. The big question is, does it work? Now, in the systematic review and meta-analysis, is, uh, uh, was published in 2006, where the authors looked at antifungal prophylaxis and outcomes. They included six studies, about 700 patients. And what they found was that the incidence of invasive tissue infections, superficial infections, total fungal infections significantly reduced. In fact, the mortality that could be attributed to fungal infections was reduced as well. However, they found no change in the overall mortality. And that's not surprising because we know that the overall mortality can be impacted by so many other factors. Similarly, they did not find any difference in empirical antifungal treatment. Now, another meta-analysis was published around the same time. This time, they included a slightly more number of studies, about 10 studies, about 1,100 patients, and the results were almost similar. You know, the overall mortality was not affected, but when we look at invasive fungal disease, that incidence was decreased significantly. Now, after these meta-analysis, there was a study that was published which looked at prophylactic amphotericin B. So they looked at about 230 high-risk liver transplant recipients, 58 of them got amphotericin B and 174 got no prophylaxis. What they found was that in the no prophylaxis group, there was a four-fold greater risk of fungal infection and the use of prophylaxis decreased the overall treatment cost by about 9%. So let's look at what is the current practice with regards to antifungal therapy across various continents. Let's start with North America. Now, this was an electronic survey which was conducted across all active adult liver transplant programs in North America. They had a pretty good uh, completion rate of about 60%. And what they found was that about 90% of the centers that filled in the survey employed antifungal prophylaxis. In 28% of these, it was universal. That was for all comers. In 72%, it was targeted towards high-risk patients only. A similar survey was conducted in Europe, where they sent an electronic and postal survey questionnaire to all the European liver transplant centers. 
Now their completion rate was slightly lower, but still pretty good at about 47%. What they found was that about 88% of these hospitals employed antifungal prophylaxis, 40% had universal and 60% had targeted. Now, unfortunately, I did not find any study similar to this coming out of Asia. So I don't know what the incidence is in uh, the Asian continent. Now let's discuss targeted versus universal prophylaxis and look at some state uh, data. So this was a retrospective study of all liver transplant recipients uh, that came out of UPMC in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania over the years 2008 to 2012. So at their institution, up till October 2010, they were giving universal prophylaxis to all patients. And starting November 2010, they started giving targeted prophylaxis. So they compared the incidence between these two timeframes. And what they found was that there was no difference in incidence of invasive fungal infections or associated mortality. Now, another study that got, came out of Spain, it was the study cohort of the Restera Reiki study, where 12 Spanish hospitals were included from September 2003 to February 2005, and they compared the incidence of invasive fungal infection in low-risk patients were, who received prophylaxis. They identified about 800 such patients, and they found no difference in the incidence of invasive fungal infections between those receiving the prophylaxis versus not. So what we can safely say is based on these studies and general data that's available to us that targeted prophylaxis is much better than universal prophylaxis. Now let's talk about the agents that are available to us and if there's any difference between uh, them. Again, this was a systematic review and a network meta-analysis that was published in 2014 where the authors compared amphotericin B, fluconazole, itraconazole, and placebo to see if there was a difference with the use of these agents. What they found was that both fluconazole and amphotericin B reduced the odds of invasive fungal infections versus placebo. They did not find any difference between the two or when they compared it with itraconazole. Now, a randomized controlled trial was done between andalafungin versus fluconazole in university affiliated transplant centers. So they randomized 200 high risk liver transplant recipients to receive either andalafungin or fluconazole. Again, what they found was that both these drug, drugs had similar efficacy for antifungal prophylaxis. And what they suggested was that anadolafungin may be beneficial in patients who had increased risk of aspergillus infection or those who received fluconazole before transplantation. Both were very well tolerated and the incidence of graft rejection, fungal free survival and mortality were similar. Now, when we talk about duration, it has been suggested that the targeted prophylaxis against both of these organisms be continued for about 14 to 21 days. However, heterogeneous lengths have been adopted, and that's more because of the dynamic and poorly predictable post-op course that these patients have. Now, let's conclude by talking about what do international guidelines recommend? Now, these are the most latest guidelines that, are, that I found. These are the American Society of Transplantation and Infectious Disease Community of Practice guidelines that were published last year. So let's start with prophylaxis for invasive aspergillosis. What they recommend is that we should not be giving universal prophylaxis. Targeted prophylaxis should be given to patients who get retransplanted. Patients who receive renal re replacement therapy at the time of or within seven days of transplantation, and those who undergo reoperation. As far as drugs, they recommend castofungin, andalafungin, microfungin, and voriconazole as the first choice, followed by amphotericin B as the second law, second choice. And they recommend a duration of about 14 to 21 days. Now, moving on to prophylaxis for invasive candidiasis. Again, they do not recommend universal prophylaxis. They recommend targeted prophylaxis amongst the group of patients that I've highlighted in the slide here. As far as duration, again, two to four weeks post-liver transplantation. And they recommend that we give azoles or echinocandins uh, over amphotericin B. Now, because of the safety profile and the low cost, fluconazole is recommended as the first choice. What they say is patients who also have a risk factor for invasive aspergillosis, an antifungal agent with aspergillus activity should be used. Now, a lot of institutions and a lot of centers have come up with their own ways of how they manage antifungal therapy after liver transplantation. And here's a flowchart of what we do at our institution. 
So if, you know, we look for risk factors for mold infections, if they have risk factors, which I've mentioned in the flow chart here, then this gets started on caspofungin 35 milligrams IV daily till the liver enzyme stabilize. And then we change to vorticonazole 200 milligrams uh, POBID to complete one month of post-transplant prophylaxis. If they do not have risk factors for mold, we look for risk factors for invasive Canada. If they have them, we give them caspofungin again for the same duration till the liver enzymes normalize. Then we switch to fluconazole 400 once a day for a total of 30 days. In patients who do not have either of those two risk factors, we give topical therapy. So in conclusion, invasive fungal infections are very common after liver transplantation. They're associated with a significantly high morbidity and mortality. The trends are favorable, but we have to keep in mind we're transplanting sicker and sicker patients. Our criteria for transplantation are getting liberalized. So we'd have to be careful. Prophylaxis does work and targeted prophylaxis is better than universal. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks Kunal. It was wonderful listening to you after such a long time and it was a lot, very much informative. Uh, May I know, like, do you use only the clinical risk factors for uh, starting antifungals in high-risk patients or are you using any biomarkers like galactomannan or beta-D-glucan before starting antifungals? Uh, thank you, Anil, for the question. Yeah, that's a good question as to whether we use biomarkers to initiate antifungal therapy or we just follow clinical uh, parameters. So we only follow clinical parameters. And if you look at the guidelines, uh, the ones that I mentioned, they also talk about the fact that, uh, you know, the lectamin tests and those are not something that they recommend as the basis of starting uh, antifungal prophylaxis. And are you following the like TDM for therapeutic drug monitoring for antifungals because of the interactions with immunosuppressants? And so, uh, you know, as I had mentioned in my flow chart, I didn't go over the whole thing. Yes, we do that. So we kind of adjust the tacrolimus dosing based on when we start and when we change any doses of fluconazole or voriconazole. Yes, we do monitor uh, the drug levels. Uh, and it was, again, uh, because of the lack of time, I didn't go over the whole thing on the flow chart. Thanks a lot. Hi, Dr. Kunal, uh, Sangeeta Shetty here. Uh, I wanted to know in your experience, uh, are you finding patients post COVID coming for liver transplant? And uh, do you see an increased rate of uh, fungal infections in them? They have been on courses of steroids. Um, so do you have any pointers on that? So uh, thank you for the question. That's a good question. The question is for post-COVID liver transplant patients who are on steroids, because right now, I mean, we're using steroids for all our uh, COVID patients. If there's an increased risk of uh, fungal infections, uh, you know, when they get the transplant. So, you know, frankly, the numbers are so low of these patients uh, that I don't think we can uh, safely say that there is a higher incidence of not on these, uh, in these patients. But I think because of that risk, we are putting them on uh, targeted antifungal prophylaxis, uh, you know, because they kind of meet that high risk criteria because they were on pre liver transplant steroids. But I, you know, again, at my institution, maybe maybe have done one or two patients uh, post COVID liver transplant. And in general, I don't think there is enough data to just look and say, you know what, these patients have a high incidence, but a very valid question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Any other questions from the panel? Just one question, Dr. Kunal. Thank you for that talk. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Vaishali here. Any experience with posoconazole or isoconazole as a uh, targeted prophylaxis? No. Uh, so again, uh, the question is whether any uh, we uh, we've had any experience with uh, fosaconazole or uh, you know posoconazole for uh, prophylaxis. Frankly, at our institution, we're pretty restrictive on. Uh, the drugs that we use, and we haven't used these drugs for prophylaxis at all. Uh, so no, I, I personally do not. I mean, maybe if uh, Ryan is on call at Mayo, they might be using it, but uh, we haven't used it at all. Thank you.
Hi, Kunal. I'm Dr. Samir from PGH Chandigarh. I want to ask a question. As you rightly said, the targeted and uh, regime is the best. But I want to know whether you always wait for the targeted regime to be started, or do you ever try it prophylactically or empirical treatment also? Because it takes a lot of time to get the results of targeted uh, regimes or these things. So, do you ever so, uh, try empirical regimes or not? So the question is whether uh, you know we use uh, targeted all the time or do we start empiric therapy in these patients? So to answer your questions, and uh, you know, I kind of it kind of links with Anil's question as well. You know, if you look at the clinical factors, right? If you know a patient that's coming after liver transplant to you in the ICU and they had been on uh, you know uh, steroids or if they had general risk factors, you can start them on. Or if the surgeon said, you know, we had a hard time, there was a biliary leak, we did dysanastomosis, then we start them on. But we bear, you know, I haven't seen anyone get empiric fungal uh, therapy at our institution. It's mostly targeted. And if we have any, so again, with liver transplant, it's more of a multidisciplinary role, right? So as perioperative, uh, you know, physicians, as an anesthesiologist, as an intensivist, if we have doubts, we get our infectious disease colleagues on board. We talk to the transplant surgeon. And based on the overall picture, we make that determination. But I would say 99% of the times, it's targeted prophylaxis versus empiric treatment. Okay, thank you. And a very sure. nice and impressive talk. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Hello. I hope uh, we all had our uh, very informative uh, uh, session from you. Thank you. Uh, for the next uh, topic, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Dalim. Dr. Dalim is an additional professor, Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine, and Critical Care at Ames, New Delhi. Hi, Dr. Dalim, are you there? Hello. Yeah, hello. Welcome, Dr. Dalim. Yeah. Mm. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, it's visible. You can start. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I will be discussing the role of uh, point of care ultrasonography in transplant anesthesia and critical care. So it's a, a big topic actually you conduct usually one and a half to two days workshop. So the purpose of this talk will be to give a brief overview and sensitize people about the role of uh, focus in uh, transplant anesthesia and uh, critical care. So uh, the overview of my talk will be uh, to mainly uh, discuss the basic role of focus, namely the cardiopulmonary focus. So uh, in the, um, focused echocardiography, we do the hemodynamic assessment of the patient who is in shock or hemodynamically unstable to look for volume status, cardiac contractility. In the pulmonary uh, focus, we try to diagnose various respiratory complications like uh, evolving pneumonia in a post-operative patients or pulmonary edema, accidental pneumothorax or pleural effusion and so forth. In patients who are uh, late in the ICU, have you having difficulty in weaning, we do diaphragmatic assessment to look for the various risk factors for difficult or failed weaning. There are a few other aspects like uh, role of uh, ultrasonography in vascular cannulation. In patients who are suspected to have raised ICP, you can look for the optic nerve sheath diameters. There are various other advanced roles like say the assessment of cardiac output and uh, by doing a passive leg raising, you can uh, do the um, uh, fluid responsiveness tests. Uh, TE, I won't talk about much because we do not regularly do it in our perioperative setup. However, advanced echo in the form of TE or even transthoracic can be done to assess the morphology and the various abnormalities of the valves and shunts. Whereas there are evolving roles of Doppler assessment, which is being nowadays done by the critical care physicians as well in terms of mainly predicting AKI in uh, critically ill patients by uh, looking at the renal artery resistive index and all. Anyway, I'll restrict my uh, talk into the basic roles. So to talk about uh, focused echocardiography, uh, mainly the role of it is to approach a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. 
the beauty of tt is that it's very easy to perform one can learn it quickly it's uh, non invasive at all and uh, more importantly most of our uh, hemodynamic monitoring the invasive monitoring like say lidco or uh, vigilios are mainly validated in uh, patients who are on control ventilation so in post operative period in patients who are on spontaneous breathing the role of echocardiography is enormous and it can it can give you a very quick diagnosis you can do an anatomical assessment as well as the functional assessment of the structures and moreover you can do you know monitor the thera response to the therapy of instituted so i'll briefly go through the uh, basic views in the trans thoracic echocardiography we have four basic views the parasternal long axis parasternal short axis uh, the <coughs> apical four chamber and the subcostal views so uh, the first view is the parasternal long axis view where you put the echo probe in the left parasternal areas uh, pointing the probe towards the right shoulder and you get this view where you can see the la lv the lv outflow track and part of the rv which is basically the rbot and uh, in this view we mainly look for the uh, contractility of the heart the lvot diameter you can measure at this area you look for the presence of pericardial effusion beneath the heart to precisely uh, have a better idea about the contractility you can do a fractional sorting assessment so what you do is that in the plax view run an m mode so the lv cavity and you can see uh, this beautiful views of lv in the diastole and systole you measure the diameters and from that you can calculate the fractional shortening the change the diameter from uh, diastole to systole divided by the diastolic diameter expressed in percentage so normal the fs is around 25 to 40% and if you double it you get a rough ejection fraction and in lv dysfunction the L, this fractional shortening will reduce more the dysfunction there will be progressive shortening of the progressive reduction in the fractional shortening whereas to the uh, mitral anterior mitral leaflet if you run m mode you can see nice view of the mitral valve in the uh, m mode and uh, the the e point septal separation what we talk about is basically at the beginning of uh, diastole the mitral valve anterior leaflet comes in relatively closer contact to the intraventricular septum so more close it is better the contractility so normally epss is less than 7 mm whereas a uh, higher eps like more than 10 mm suggests there is significant lv dysfunction you can look for uh, any quick area below the left ventricle in this view which uh, is most often than not is a pericardial effusion however sometimes pleural effusion can also appear in this view so to differentiate that you have to look at the descending thoracic aorta any any quick effusion which is lying above the descending aorta is a pericardial effusion and anything lying below it is a probably a pleural effusion now if we uh, uh, rotate the probe 90 degree and the pointer looks toward the left shoulder then you get what we call p sex parasternal short axis view and now if you tilt the probe uh, in this uh, view you progressively get various uh, views like if you uh, tilt the probe downwards you get the first the lv apex a little bit upward still to give you a nice papillary muscle view where you can see the left ventricular cavity and the papillary muscles further up till will give you a mitral valve view and further up will give you a view of the base of the heart where you can see the nice mercedes benz appearance of the aortic uh, valve and the rv uh, right ventricular rvot and the pulmonary artery view so uh, all of these views have uh, significances but briefly for our purpose the most important view is the uh the papillary muscles view where you can see the papillary muscles uh, and the contraction of the um, heart in patients who is volume depleted will have this papillary muscles touching each other at the end of systole which is called kissing papillary and it suggests hypovolemia uh, however in patients who have very hyperkinetic heart sometimes can have uh, this kissing papillary sign as well uh in patients in whom you suspect acute coronary syndrome there can be regional valve motion abnormalities which in which uh, condition you will be seeing some part of the cardiac uh, muscle may not be contracting so well compared to the other uh, parts and from the area of uh, dyskinesia or akinesia you can identify which uh, arterial supply is perhaps at fault um in right ventricular overload situations like say acute pulmonary embolism or pulmonary hypertension the interventricular septum will uh, 
pulse towards the LV and which gives initially what we call a decipsed LV. Uh, in these conditions, if you suspect acute P, uh, try to look at the parasternal short axis, the aortic valve view, where you can have a direct look at the RVOT and the pulmonary uh, main pulmonary trunk and initial part of the right and left branches. If you uh, can do the do the scan better, so this gives you a rough idea about the presence of uh, PE. The next and most commonly used view is the apical four chamber view, in which you get good views of the all four chambers, LA, LV, and RA, RV. And in this view, you look at the contractility, any effusion, the RV function, and you can measure the uh, stroke volume as well. So, uh, for example, for uh, pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade, you can see uh, the anechoic area surrounding the heart and Whenever you get a pericardial effusion, look for the signs of tamponade, which will be uh, apparent by uh, the collapse of the uh, uh, the ventricles and the uh, atria. Initially, the atria will collapse and initially in the diastole. With further progressive uh, tamponade, there will be systolic collapse more in the RV. In case of RV overload, as I said, the IV intraventricular septum will deviate towards the LV. So you will get this kind of picture where RV cavity volume may be larger than the LV. Normally, RV is around two-thirds of the volume of the LV cavity. And to precisely uh, measure the function of uh, right ventricle, you can do what we call a TAPSE, which is a tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So where you uh, put a uh, M mode to the annulus of the tricuspid valve, and uh, uh, in that M mode, you can measure the um, uh, the movement of the tricuspid valve in systole and diastole. Normally, it's around 1.5 to 2 centimeter. Whenever the RV dysfunction occurs, the TAPSA will reduce further. To calculate for the uh, stroke volume, we what we do is called an apical five chamber view. In this view, from the four chamber view, tilt the probe slightly to open up the LV outflow tract area. And there we put a pulse wave Doppler. And this pulse wave Doppler will give you a nice uh, tracing of uh, the velocity time integral and the value can be uh, 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 can, can be obtained from the pre-designed softwares in the eco uh, machines. So with this velocity time integral, if you multiply with the LVOT area, the LVOT area is cal calculated in the parasternal long axis view. So the multiplication of LVOT VTA and the area will give you uh, the volume, what we call stroke volume. And uh, in this particular view, you can check for the volume responsive, responsiveness as well. So for that, uh, we need to do a passive leg raising test. So in the passive leg raising, you elevate the leg end of the bed by 45 degree and look for the changes in the stroke volume. Usually it should be limited to less than 12%, but uh, in patients who uh, can be volume responsive, the stroke volume uh, change in response to PLR will be higher. The subcostal view is important uh, in patients in whom the getting the other windows may be difficult. For example, in patients with emphysema or COPD, uh, you can uh, easily see the four chambers in the uh, subcostal views. Pericardial diffusion or tamponade again will be apparent very easily in this kind of views. And another utility of this view is to look for the IVC. The um, uh, subcostal IVC uh, view is very easy to get. You just need to place the probe longitudinally and you can see the uh, IVC. You need to differentiate it from the aorta. The aorta will be uh, quite pulsatile uh, in, the, in this view. So uh, just by the appearance of IVC, you can have a fair idea about the volume status of the patient. For example, a kissing IVC will suggest a volume depleted patient, whereas a very full IVC, which is not uh, changing its diameter during phases of inspiration, will suggest probably a uh, probably the patient is volume replete. However, in patients with RV failure, uh, the IVC may again be full. So, but always it will not be very apparent like a full IVC which is not moving at all. In most of the patients, when you have some dilemma about the volume status, there will be uh, some uh, change in the diameter of the IVC. And what we need to calculate here is that IVC collapsibility or distensibility. So for that, we need to uh, run an M mode through the IVC. So on M mode, you'll get an appearance of this uh, changing diameter of the IVC and you just calculate the maximum, the change in the diameter, which is the maximum minus minimum divided by the mean diameter expressed in percentages. So this IVC collapsibility or the distensibility will give you an idea about the volume status of the patient. In spontaneous breathing patients, 
the the ibis will collapse on inspiration so the collapsibility index we call it whereas in patients who are on mechanical ventilator we call it distensibility index because the ibc distends on inspiration so uh, usually suggested cutoff value is uh, 50% uh, for collapsibility index whereas 12 to 18% for distensibility index to detect uh, or predict volume responsiveness now te as i said i will not be talk about too much but uh, th these are the few basic Uh, important views of T, which are uh, uh, relevant in uh, regular critical care practice. The mediastinal four chamber uh, views is very important to diagnose again the uh, feeling, the contractility, the effusions, the pericardial effusions, and all. Uh, and uh, to better assess the contractility and the volume status, you can look for the transgastric uh, short axis view. However, there are a few concerns with T, like uh, for example, in patients <coughs> who uh, have is of visual varices and history of gi bleeds we may be hesitant in putting a t uh, but i think we can get the mid esophageal views easily because most of the varices will be in the lower esophagus the transgastric view is a bit difficult to perform intraoperatively because most of the time stomach will be you know retracted however in the post operative period it will be very handy there are these are few uh, videos of the uh, t which uh, just to show you how the contractility uh, we can just by eyeballing looking at the heart we can uh, have a fair assessment of the contractility and even if we do not know the calculations it's okay so uh, this uh, picture on your right shows the mild dysfunction in the lv contractility whereas uh, the moderate dysfunction just by looking at the heart you can say the lv is not contracting so well like the normal lv which is on the left side in case of severe dysfunction uh, you can see on the right side the lv is hardly contracting at all and uh, this shows a hyperkinetic uh, heart hyperkinetic left ventricle so coming to the lung ultrasound quickly uh, we divide the lungs uh, each lung into six uh, sono zones by two vertical lines through the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line and always we should do scanning of all six zones so the predominant pointers to look for are the lungs presence or absence of lung sliding and whether it's a profile or b profile so uh, this is what we call lung sliding in between the two ribs we get a nice uh, um, eco texture glistening white structure which moves this is because of the parietal and the uh, visceral pleura slide against each other and this is uh, the sign of a normal lung this is what we call a profile where we get horizontal uh, uh, lines due to reverberation artifacts below the pleural structure throughout the lung zone as uh, far down as you can see and this is again such as normal lung so uh, presence of lung sliding and a profile is uh, what you get when you put a uh, probe on the uh, normal uh, lung and if you put an m mode m mode through that you see this kind of view which is called c shore sign the bright uh, line is uh, denoting the pleura and the above is c the below is the shore and this is again a normal finding now what happens in case of pneumothorax the lung sliding will be lost in the area where pneumothorax is if you put a probe the lung sliding will be gone and if you uh, run an m mode through it again the c shore pattern will be lost and it will be uh, looking like a barcode pattern so this is called barcode or the stratosphere sign and if you do the, do the scanning uh, of entire lung you can get some point where uh, the probe will be on the margin of the pneumothorax and the normal lung so in that space you can see part of the pleura which is moving whereas part of the pleura which is not moving at all so this is uh, called lung point and this is pathognomony of uh, pneumothorax now this is what we call b profile here there will be a vertical line coming uh, arising from uh, the pleura and they are coming downwards reaching till the bottom of the screen there uh, can be various b lines and this suggests uh, fluid overload in evolving uh, interstitial edema or frank pulmonary edema you can have uh, this kind of views which are b profile however the important point we need to know is that with more and more uh, frank alveolar edema there will be more confluence of b lines and they uh, uh, they will be difficult to differentiate whereas initial phases you can have Uh, separate b lines uh, ad identified now here another important point is that uh, 
in patients with ARDS and not cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you can you also get B line, but there are some characteristic differences. For example, in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, B lines will be more homogeneous and more often associated with plural effusions, whereas in non-cardiogenic edema, it will be more heterogeneous with spared areas, uh, with consolidations at times, and very commonly with plural line abnormalities. This is what Dr. I call, Gavin, would you yeah. conclude? Yeah, I will sum up. Uh, I'll just take another three, four minutes. So this is what we call uh, plural line abnormalities. This is more characteristic of uh, evolving pneumonia, viral and bacterial. Next is the plaps point, which is uh, similar to the costophrenic angle in the chest X-ray. There you can see evolving consolidations. You need to look at the diaphragm and the, uh, the lung structures above where uh, consolidations and part of the arrested lung can be uh, lung can be seen uh, quite uh, nicely and this uh, shows how the air bronchogram looks like in um, uh, evolving phases of consolidations you can have uh, this kind of uh, pictures of dynamic air bronchogram and uh, this is how plural effusion look like you'll have an akinetic uh, uh, plural fluid with collapsed uh, lung underneath so uh, most of the things can be diagnosed by this approach. In case of COPD asthma or pulmonary embolism, you won't really have in some characteristic features and the lung scan will look normal. In case of uh, su su suspected pulmonary embolism, you need to look for the you know, DVT scanning and look for non-compressibility of the major uh, lower limb uh, veins. So uh, most of the times we should do combination of heart and lung uh, together in uh, critically ill patients in ICU. For example, this kind of pictures where you see uh, uh, over B lines along with well-filled heart and a distended IVC, this suggests that probably the patient is having a lot of fluid in the body. And if it had been fluid resuscitation, resuscitation the, it's, it's the end point of that. A quick couple of words on diaphragm. Uh, the diaphragmatic excursion we see when you put the probe on the uh, entry axillary line and uh, do the M mode, you can see the diaphragmatic excursion between inspiration and expiration. Normally, it's around 10 millimeter or more, whereas in patients who are difficult winning, the excursion will be lost and it will be much less. And uh, by putting a linear probe in the costophrenic area, you can actually see the diaphragm. And uh, if you run an M mode, you can uh, actually measure the change in the diaphragmatic uh, thickness of the diameter during inspiration and expiration. In inspiration, it thickens, and this diaphragmatic thickness fraction is usually more than 36%, whereas a low uh, DTF suggests the patient may have a difficult winning. Um, I was looking up the uh, literature for uh, the uh, utility of point-of-care ultrasound in liver transplant setup, and the, the, the literature is very uh, less, you know. There are a few uh, series of... Uh, the utility of uh, this uh, transthoracic uh, uh, eco for uh, volume status uh, and few report of uh, plural effusion being diagnosed, which are missed on chest X-ray by preoperative um, uh, lung ultrasound scans. And I could find a, uh, a study on from ILBS where they are trying to detect the utility of lung ultrasound in postoperative pulmonary uh, complications. Uh, I think time is short, so I'll uh, skip this. Uh, utilities on the vascular cannulations and uh, the transocular ultrasound. So to summarize, uh, the cardiopulmonary POCAS mainly uh, relevant in critical care practices. Uh, in uh, if when you are approaching a patient with uh, hemodynamic instability or shock, and in uh, patients where you are suspecting a post-operative pulmonary complications like evolving hospital acquired or ventilator-associated pneumonia or draining a plural effusion. It's very easy to do, non-invasive, and has a short learning curve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dalim. It was very informative and probably would make us less dependent on the cardiologists or the radiologist in emergencies when we are very short in time. So thanks for the Thanks for sharing your presentation. Uh, for to the chairpersons or the panelists, any questions to Dr. Dalim? Yeah, hello. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Dalim, this is Dr. Weber here. Yes, Dr. Weber, hello. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Uh, my question to is, uh,
basically uh, uh, the basic focus, uh, cardiac focus. How can we use to our you know uh, utility in uh, managing patient in OT like uh, for hemodynamics, like uh -huh. uh, uh, and definitely we don't don't have the basically I'm talking about the transthoracic uh, yeah. uh, echocardiography. How can we use for patient in operation theater to help uh, managing the hemodynamics? Yeah. So, uh, transthoracic echo uh, in uh, inside the operating room, you can do, uh, you need to have access to the heart for that. And, uh, you know, here, uh, the getting an apical view or a subcostal view is not possible. So, you can, you may have to rely mainly on the parasternal long axis view and short axis view. And we need to have a uh, basic uh, question in mind why we need to do the echo. So, the basic purpose of uh, point of care ultrasound is that we have a focused question and just to answer that question, we are looking at the echocardiography. For example, in the OT, the situations which might arise are say hypovolemia, there can be poor uh, cardiac contractility or uh, in some cases say air embolism or pulmonary embolism or something like that. So uh, by looking at the heart at the parasternal short axis or a long axis view, uh, just what we do is eyeballing we may not be able to do all the measurements at that point of time because the access is limited. So by just eyeballing, we know that yes, the heart is not contracting well and maybe stepping up the inotropes further will, will be helpful. Or um, uh, you see if uh, say the, uh, the, the volume, uh, the LV is actually, even if you don't measure the LV and diastolic area or the diameter, that's okay. But LV looks small in the parasternal short axis view. So the papillaries are kissing uh, with each other. It looks underfilled. So that may be the time to, you know, push in some fluid. Or for example, uh, following reperfusion when uh, there is maybe RV overload. So if you see that um, that the RV uh, interventricular septum is bulging towards the you know uh, left side, so uh, so probably there is some RV strain, uh, something like that. T may be more useful in diagnosing pulmonary embolism or air embolism because uh, in T you can you know uh, you can keep it uh, inside uh, the esophagus or the stomach and in different times you can use it. So there, uh, the role will be more, uh, uh, the role of T will be more important in diagnosing air embolism or you know, pulmonary embolism, where that, is, that will be a bit difficult with T. Um, but I feel more important role of focus in the post-operative period because uh, most of our, you know, the, the hemodynamic monitorings are not well validated in spontaneously breathing uh, patients. Okay, thank you. Stalin, this is not... Hi, Kunal. Nice to see you. Hi, how are you, darling? Very nice to see you, man. Very nice to see you. Very nice talk. Uh, now, clinically, I mean, uh, do you guys use a lot of focus in these post-operative patients in the ICU? Because I know you, you, you know, in the OR or OT, it's very hard. I mean, the access is limited. And as I think Shweta also mentioned in her uh, uh, comments there, I think the utility is more in the post-operative period when they're in the ICU. So what's the clinical scenario uh, right now with you guys in AB8? Uh, is that something that you routinely do? Yeah, this is uh, with us routinely. Uh, we routinely use focus, mainly the cardiac and the pulmonary focus for uh, various reasons. We do a uh, lot of procedures under it also, like uh, say tapping pleural equation or diagnosis of pneumothorax. In fact, our residents do it regularly. So most of the times, uh, you know, residents do it. It's available and accessible to them. We have a couple of uh, you know, machines in the ICU and in the OR as well. So it's very commonly done. We uh, do otherwise also say, for example, in uh, before Parkinson's tracheostomies, we uh, always do a scan to identify the vessels and identify the puncture sites. Uh, so T, uh, we are not really doing regularly. We have it, but uh, mainly in the cardiac anesthesia setup, they do it uh, every day, but we really do not do it regularly. We do TT uh, quite a lot and uh, the lung scans. Thanks, darling. Very nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Dr. But time was so short, actually, I probably could not do proper justice. We usually do one to two days workshop on focus and bringing it down in 20 minutes was almost impossible for me. Uh, it was very, very informative and it definitely um, will help us to tackle a few emergency situations in our ICU or motivate us to learn a few more uh, 
endoscopy you know, these thing ultrasound things thank you thank you dr ali thanks a lot now we would like to move to our next session where we have a chairperson dr kosar makki senior consultant liver transplant and hpv surgeon uh, fortis hospital ncr and dr anil agwa senior consultant anesthesia and liver transplant and critical care uh, fortis hospital ncr for this session we have uh, as a speaker dr piyush senior consultant and head of department of anesthesia and critical care fortis hospital ncr thank you amit thank you anil and thank you kosher for, for being here and the, uh, being a part of this uh, industry sponsored asterisk sponsored in, uh, talk on the invasive fungal infection in the liver transplant recipient so definitely this is the last lecture probably we we are the only one attending the session so this is a general disclaimer and i will be covering this talk under these uh, headings so we all know that invasive fungal infection are one of the dreaded complication uh, of the transplant after the transplant and uh, in systemic fungal infection the outcome of the disease depends more on the host factor rather than the fungal virulence itself so the, after the transplant patients immunity are very low because of the liver disease itself and uh, because of the introduced immunosuppression so chances of the fungal infection are high even the the fungal uh, the fungus who are not that virulent may show their uh, uh, very negative impact on the outcome so the incidence of uh, fungal infection in hepatic transplant varies widely between the different center it may be because of their uh, different policies regarding the prophylaxis uh, uh, behind the fungal infection or uh, uh, policies of uh, using different uh, antifungal agents so during early transplant period incidence of uh, fungal infection reported was as high as 30% to 50% but with the advent of uh, uh, newer antifungal agents and improvement in the transplant practice and uh, because of the improved surgical technique and uh, better understanding of the uh, the, the, the issues uh, going with the uh, post transplant patients the chances uh, the incidence of infection has gone down drastically to 10% in early 21st century and in fact uh, the the patients who are coming for the liver transplant nowadays are not that as sick or not uh, are, are coming with the for, for different indications also like hepatocellular carcinoma or pbc and all where the incidence of uh, where the where the liver disease itself is not that severe and they are being transplanted for the different reason and mortality related to invasive fungal infection in hepatic transplant patient is very high because of the reason i told you so this was a study observed a uh, recent study which observed a relatively low incidence of invasive fungal infection as i uh, thought with because of the reason i discussed before this was another study uh, uh, which observed relative high incidence but uh, it, it it was because of the uh, the patient population the patients who were transplanted were actually more sicker and the the the, the number of patients who have acute and chronic liver failure as an indication was higher so that may be the reason behind the little high incidence of invasive fungal infection in this particular population in the major indian transplant center this was a study published and what they found that uh, they studied on the 64 patients undergoing uh, ldlt with the six month follow up 38 patients had a 100th infectious episode 10 patients had single infection episode and 28 patient had two or more infectious episode while well, 96 like uh, 96 patient but which, which accounts 93.2% about the bacterial and the candida infection were in the seven patient that was 6.8% that i think that's a significant percent in the post transplant patient in early phase they had a 30 uh, episode and uh, 24.2% had a intermediate phase and late phase uh, there was a 48 patients and the mortality was uh, uh, around 17.1% and what they found that the 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 sensitivity of the uh, agents uh, to, uh, towards the, the the fungus which grew the, the mycofungin had a 100% sensitivity against the candida albicans and against candida tropicalis and candida parapsilosis so it was a uh, mycofungin had a pan sensitivity towards all these uh, fungus while other agent had a limited or uh, variable uh, sensitivity 
So antifungal prophylaxis has brought down the incidence of candidemia as nicely discussed. So what are the risk factors? So when we talk about candida prolonged and complicated transplant uh, uh, surgery or a patient who underwent cholidoprogesnostomy during the surgery, prolonged broad based spectrum antibiotic use in those patients who have been uh, prolonged hospitalization where the creatinine has high or the patient has required post-dialysis, post-transplant dialysis, or patient who have been uh, transplanted, uh, who have uh, retransplanted, or patient who having a candida colonization and CFV infection together. On the other hand, aspergillus species, fulminant hepatitis as an indication for liver transplantation, pre or broad spectrum antibiotic use, retransplantation, the, high, the risk of uh, aspergillus infection is pretty high, is 30% high, but, uh, along with that renal failure, especially requiring uh, uh, regular dialysis and the severe immunosuppression and the CMV disease together. At the same time, the cryptococcus grows in the patient who are severely immunosuppressed and had a CMV disease uh, as a baseline. The immunosuppressive agents impair cell mediated immunity. We all know because we have to uh, let the our, uh, body accept the impl uh, implanted graft. So patients are put on the immunosuppression agents. So these immunosuppression agents anyway reduces the immunity and increases the risk of uh, uh, fung fungal infection in these particular patients. We know that whenever there is an invasive fungal infection, it affects uh, not as a single uh, organ, it, it affects a multiple organ system, like it, it leads to meningitis and encephalitis, can lead to the uh, eyeball fungal infection, that's endophthalmitis, then pulmonary aspergillosis, bilirubin tract infection, peritonitis, and candiduria. And if the invasive fungal infection happens, it, 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 it has a very poor uh, outcome and a very high mortality after the transplant or any other surgery. How you diagnose the invasive fungal infection? It's not very straightforward. As in the previous lecture, it was discussed that you sometimes you need to be targeted, but sometimes you need to be empirical, sometimes you need to be uh, deciding based on, on the clinical finding and the clinical risk factors. So the chest X-ray and the CT uh, depicted the nodal infiltration and cavitation with the characteristic halo sign in case of pulmonary aspergillosis. Pretty, pretty uh, classical uh, sign and to diagnose the uh, uh, as, as per uh, uh, infection in the lungs. Brain CT may reveal multiple brain abscesses in case of neural aspergillosis, so it's not very uh, uh, difficult to diagnose based on the imaging things. Candida is the most common fungal type uh, implicated in the post-hepatic transplant invasive fungal infection. So if you see the the distribution. So, if we find that the 27 uh, uh, patients who have candida, while the seven patients had aspergillosis, on the other hand, cryptococcus, histoplasmosis, and fusarium infections are the incidents are not that much. Among the ca candida infection, the candida albicans is the most notorious. It is very common, and it 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 it, it actually accounts for more than 50 percent of the candida infection uh, after the transplant. And Bassetti uh, uh, et al. found that the, uh, apart from the albicans, topicalis, paraphosilosis, or the uh, uh, other specific candida uh, fungus, who, which, which actually uh, complicates the, uh, uh, the outcome of the uh, patients after the liver transplant. So majority of the candida infection occurs within the first three months of the hepatic transplant. In a retrospective multicentric uh, multi national study conducted by the Basati et al., what they found that the 34.1% and the 46.3% cases of uh, uh, infections occur respectively during the first month and within three months after the surgery. Patient with early that be, uh, uh, infection happening within three months after the transplant, the, they were more likely uh, because of the they were they were hospitalized in the ICU ward. So that was 68%, 68% versus 31%. The p value was significant, and to have acute renal failure. On the other hand, uh, when it, it, it when we talk about aspergillus, so aspergillus fumigatus uh, has a highest incidence uh, in, uh, infection. So it, we are, when we talk about the prophylaxis, so it was nicely uh, discussed in the previous lecture by the Kunal uh, for the uh, antifungal prophylaxis, but here again I'm discussing, and this was the guideline put up by the European Association for the Study of Liver, and, uh, and they recommend the routine candida prophylaxis post-transplant. 
And what they found that the oral kind of prophylaxis reduces the mortality. Fluconazole is a drug of choice for the prophylaxis. On the other hand, aspergillus prophylaxis recommended only in the high risk cases, the, the indication what we discussed earlier and what I am repeating again, the, the patients who have prolonged use of the steroid before transplant, like patients who have alcoholic hepatitis, they are usually put up under some steroids. The patient who have acute renal failure requiring the dialysis, the patients have the, uh, acute liver failure, then the patients undergoing retransplantation, and the patient who had a massive transfusion during the surgery or the patients who have uh, uh, early re-exploration for the, whatever the reason for the, and uh, persistent renal failure in post-transplant or the patients requiring the dialysis. So uh, this uh, slide we earlier discussed that the Mika have a higher 100% uh, sensitivity for the all candidate strains comparing to, to the fluconazole, voriconazole, or amphotericin B or caspofungin. So uh, looking at this chart, the Mika uh, looks uh, like a drug of choice for the, against the candida infection. If we talk about the pharmacotherapy, the, these are the treatment guidelines uh, for the candidemia in non neutropenic uh, patients. This was an update from the IDSA. And uh, what they what they recommended that the initial therapy is uh, uh, should be the echinocandine strong. It, it was a strong recommendation, high quality in, uh, evidence. So uh, the transition from the uh, echinocandine to the fluconazole usually within five to seven days is recommended for patients who are clinically stable, have isolate that are susceptible to fluconazole and have negative or repeat blood culture is strongly recommendation. The evidence was moderate uh, quality. And the reasonable alternative was the lipid formulation and for B for, uh, uh, is a reasonable alternative if there is a uh, intolerance or limited availability or uh, resistance to other antifungal agents or uh, patients are allergic to those particular agents. And these are the guidelines put up by the IDSA in the patients who are neutropenic, like the CLD patients who are because of the massive splenomegaly and the pancytopenia, they, they have a, a neutropenia. So any kind of content like Mika fungin, 100 mg daily, Casper fungin loading dose of 70 mg and then 50 milligram daily, then uh, any dollar fungin loading dose of 200 mg, then 100 mg daily is recommended as an initial therapy. It was a very strongly recommendation, though the, uh, the quality of evidence was moderate. Lipid formulation, amphotericin B, 3 to 5 mg per kg daily is an effective but less attractive alternative because of the potential for, for the toxicity. And uh, though uh, the uh, recommendation was strong and the quality of evidence was moderate. On the other hand, fluconazole, the 800 mg, 12, uh, that is 12 mg per kg body weight loading dose, and then 400 mg, uh, that is 6 mg per kg daily is an alternative for patients who are not uh, critically ill and have had no prior uh, azole exposure. The recommendations are very weak and the evidence is also very weak. So how to uh, go for the selection of an antifungal? This was the update from the ESCMID uh, guideline. And what they found, recommended that the candidemia and the invasive candidiasis uh, are strongly, uh, in, ca in case of candidemia, the echinocandines are strongly recommended as an initial targeted therapy. While liposomal amphotericin B and voriconazole are supportive with the moderate and uh, fluconazole with the marginal strength. So definitely uh, in, in, in selected cases, you we have to rely upon the echinocandines and we should administer as early possible. The recommendation of current guidelines uh, as a first line treatment is echinocandines and uh, fluconazole as an acceptable alternative for selected patients clearly indicate toward the efficacy uh, conferred by the echinocandines. So this is the small case which we encountered uh, during uh, our management of uh, different cases. So this was a 56 year old female patient underwent liver transplantation for SC cirrhosis. Surgical complication included abdominal compartment syndrome because of the block drain and uh, uh, all the ascites got collected. Post-operative uh, intracutaneous fistula uh, happened and the uh, patient was put on prolonged total parental nutrition because she was not able to tolerate the oral feeds. What she had a presenting complaint, she had a severe abdominal pain and low grade fever. So she was put upon uh, all the antibiotics, but she was not responding and uh, temperature is still persisting and uh, she had a temperature of 100.5 uh, and she had abdominal tenderness also. So we sent the cultures and uh, it, it, it returned as a positive for, for with the candida, uh, candida parapsilosis. And the counts were 39,000. That is pretty uh, peculiar in the case of fungal infection. So MIC data was showing that uh, uh, for amphotericin B, it was 0.125 mics per ml. On the other hand, for fluconazole, it was 32. And for echinocandines, it was 0 
and for Wari Konazol and Posa Konazol, it was eight mics. And so five score was four, Apache score was five. That means the patient was pretty sick. And based on the culture sensitivity report, patient was started upon the mica fund in uh, and, uh, on 100 mg per, uh, per day. And uh, the clinical course was like patient remained in the ICU for five days and the culture after two weeks, we sent it repeated again. And that uh, turned to be negative after this mica fungin therapy. And patients survived with the normal hepatic and renal function that was uh, uh, that was a, a good effect from uh, what we got from the micafungin. So if we were, uh, want to discuss that, it was a typical case of post-transverse invasive candidiasis, though the patient was all, uh, also on the uh, antibiotics, but uh, uh, before, and that probably led to the uh, higher incidence of candida infection. So low-grade fever with abdominal symptom raises suspicion of abdominal candidiasis. Aggressive management involving nutritional support, fluid and electrolyte balance, and IV mycofungin helped the patient to recover from the life-threatening situation. So this was a clear-cut uh, case of a fungal infection after the transplant. So what is the key insight? So it, it, invasive fungal infection affects multiple organ system. It's not a single organ. It can affect any organ from the top to bottom. Symptoms are non-specific and vague. Incidence of uh, inf fungal infection is reported in the uh, up to 12% of the liver transplant. Invasive candidiasis is most common type of uh, infection followed by the invasive uh, aspergillosis. Case fatality rate is very high if patient develops the fungal, fungal infection. And the guideline recommends echinocandins like mycofungin as a first choice therapy for invasive candida infection. Uh, nearly all the guidelines, all the guidelines from the different societies have recommended this more or less same uh, recommendation. Recent studies suggest a strong sensitivity of candida species to mycofungin. Thank you very much for paying the attention. Thank you. Anil, any comment? Yeah, thanks, Pius. That was a wonderful presentation on invasive fungal infections and antifungals. Uh, any questions from any of the attendees or participants? If not, uh, I would like to just ask one question. What's your experience regarding invasive aspergillus infections in which patients you start targeted anti-aspergillosis therapy and preferred agent? See, uh, uh, at our center, we always uh, look at the clinical sign uh, uh, to start the uh, antifungal therapy. And if we talk about the uh, aspergillosis, so, so it can be either plain aspergillosis or it can be the mucor also. So if we suspect the mucor, because though the incidence of mucor at our center is not that much uh, till now, out of the 1,500 transplants, only five patients have developed the mucor. So if when, whenever we suspect the uh, mucor, so we always start the, with the posaconazole because we have found that the uh, posaconazole have a better uh, efficacy and effect against the mucor. But when uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, chances of an incidence of mucor looks not that much. So then we start with the amphotericin B uh, liposomal with a dose of three to five milligram per kg body weight. And the risk factor is definitely we discussed earlier also and in my presentation also. So the, exactly the, uh, it should be started early and uh, definitely uh, targeted. So Kosar is here, so uh, she's a surgeon. So I'd like her opinion on the introduction of antifungal agent in the uh, post-transplantation. So what are the conditions she likes to prefer? Uh, some uh, surgeons are pretty reluctant to you know, start with some higher end uh, antifungals. So what is your opinion, Kosar? Uh, great talk, Piyush. Uh, okay, so we do give antifungal prophylaxis for all the patients and specifically for those with... Uh, Difficult surgeries, excessive bleeding, or a difficult anastomosis. But most of it is guided by a very excellent critical care and anesthesia team. So back to you. Okay. Thank you all for this session. And I would like Piyush to confer the vote of thanks to conclude. Yeah. Hi, Piyush. Just one comment. Yes, sir. You started with saying that uh, only we are listening, but I'm driving and I'm still listening. Oh, that's so thank, great. Thank you very much Thanks. for paying the attention. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big compliment. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you I very much. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all the uh, esteemed faculties, all the delegates, and uh, all. Uh, and definitely thank you very much the audiovisual team and uh, 
I, I would definitely like to name uh, Pranav and Shilpa for uh, providing such a fantastic uh, support for in the organizing such a fantastic uh, conference without any uh, IT hitch. And um, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the sponsors who have come forward to, to help uh, this academic activity happen even in the Corona time, though it, it could not happen uh, 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 in physical, but yes, they supported in a way that the conference became successful like it uh, it happened when we did last year for, uh, for the first time so even this virtual conference we have uh, seen the fantastic attend uh, attendance and uh, we have seen uh, the number of delegates being present throughout the uh, sessions and definitely i would like to the faculties for uh, uh, this uh, giving such a fantastic talk with this uh, fantastic stuff in their uh, talks. And uh, I will definitely like to thank uh, my uh, director, Dr. Vivek Vich, for uh, making this program happen and for uh, guiding us to make this program successful. And uh, in the last, but uh, I'll definitely like to thank my team member, Anil, Amit, and uh, Suvil, and uh, Adesh, they have always been a support uh, in the background for making this conference successful. Thank you very much.